Okay, we're on the record this morning, KCR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho v. Lori Noreen Vallow. Uh, continuing jury trial in the case, the court would note the prosecution is present, the defense and the defendant are here present as well. Uh, the court will continue to remind everyone that these proceedings are subject to the court's conduct order, which, among other things, uh, prohibits the transmission of any signal, audio, or video from these proceedings and also requires you to have your cell phones silenced. This morning um, we're scheduled to have closing arguments. The court will first go through its jury instructions with the jurors before the closings. I'll also indicate that there's been a pending motion that was filed uh, the defense brought a motion under Idaho Criminal Rule 29 at the conclusion of the evidence in this case, and that's a motion for a judgment of acquittal under Rule 29. The court took that under advisement, and I'm prepared to make a ruling today on the motion for judgment of acquittal. So the looking at the dates here. On a judgment of acquittal, first I'll start with the, um, well, let me just inquire and make sure here. Is the state ready to proceed this morning with all of this? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Is the defense ready to proceed as well? Yes. Okay. Thanks, counsel. All right. The court will note that I did take that under advisement. Uh, it was motion made uh, yesterday on Wednesday on the 10th of May, and in the motion, the defense requests a judgment of acquittal under Rule 29. The state argued against the motion. Uh, some case law that governs the court on a ruling on a motion such as this. Uh, the trial court must deny the motion if there is some evidence of guilt produced at trial. That's State v. Gradio 104, Idaho 782, 1983 case. Conversely, the motion shall be granted if the record reflects a total lack of inculpatory evidence at trial. State versus Vargas, 100 Idaho 658, 1979 case. The question in those uh, cases cited then is whether or not there is evidence upon which a guilty verdict can be based. And that also cites to State versus Griffith, 127 Idaho 8, 1995 case. Some more case law on the standard for Rule 29. When a motion has been denied and the defendant has been found guilty by the jury, then all reasonable inferences on appeal are taken in favor of the prosecution. So that is the standard that applies uh, either before or after a verdict is that reasonable inferences on appeal are taken in favor of the prosecution and the state's burden of proving the elements of a criminal offense may be met through circumstantial evidence and that's state versus Willard 129 Idaho 827 1997 case uh, at the outset I'll note that obviously this has been a long trial there's been a lot of witnesses and a lot of evidence presented there are also a lot of counts um, that are charged here. The motions, as argued, were not argued really with any specificity. The defense simply requests a motion under 29 for the court to review the record essentially and determine whether there's sufficient evidence to come forward. In response, um, the state simply argues that, uh, quote, every element of all nine counts of the indictment have had evidence enough to support a conviction in the case. So neither party pointed to any specifics of the counts of any um, lack of evidence on any particular count or any particular element of any count. And uh, likewise, the state didn't map out any specific detail as to how its burden was met other than referencing the evidence that's come in in the case. So. There was substantial evidence that's come in through the many days of trial. Uh, the court's gone through the elements that are charged here, and I will make a more detailed ruling on this Rule 29 motion. 
So the first count that would be contained in the now amended indictment is conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. And again, looking at all reasonable inferences in favor of the prosecution, the first element there is the honor about October 16, 2018 to January 15, 2020 are the dates listed in the indictment for the conspiracy. Those dates were established through multiple witnesses, including some of the lead law enforcement officers, uh, Detective Hermosillo talked about the date range there. It was also established through um, FBI agents and other law enforcement officers. The element of in the state of Idaho was established for this count and other counts. There were uh, evidence admitted of a lease agreement the defendant had in the state of Idaho, evidence that she had moved to the state of Idaho to the Pioneer Road apartment. There were multiple uh, witnesses of her in the Rexburg area. There was body cam footage admitted through law enforcement officers. Um, also other testimony from other individuals about her moving to Idaho, including uh, Kay Woodcock. Also on identifying the defendant for this count and others, she was identified by multiple individuals including Kay Woodcock, Colby Ryan, and Summer Shiflett identified in court and that would be an element on each of the offenses. So the court finds there's sufficient evidence on those elements. And then going into the conspiracy itself, there was uh, allegations that there was an agreement and there was a criminal conspiracy agreement leading to the allegations of first degree murder and grand theft by deception. There was a summarizing witness towards the end of the trial, Douglas Hart from, I believe it was an FBI agent who went through a lot of the summary of the evidence that's been submitted through trial. Some of the overt acts, there was an allegation that there was an endorsement or espousal of religious beliefs for the purpose of encouraging or justifying the homicide of Tylee Ryan. Those religious beliefs were put in through evidence, through witnesses such as Zulema Pastenas, Melanie Gibbs, David Warwick, Andre Barataria. There's an allegation that there was a change in the deposit of Tylee Ryan's Social Security benefits. Um, as an overt act, Mark Sari, social security investigator, testified about that. Agent Hart testified about that as well. And I believe Colby Ryan also offered some <coughs> testimony on that point. The allegation of moving from Chandler, Arizona to Rexburg with uh, Alex Cox, Tylee Ryan, and J.J. Vallow was evidenced through testimony that came in. There was a lease agreement again, evidencing uh, change of residence. There was an overt act allegation of Chad Daybell Googling South Southwest Wind and visiting a website to define that. The Google search history of Chad Daybell was admitted as an exhibit in evidence and supports that allegation. There's an allegation in an overt act on uh, about September 9th, 2019, Alex Cox going to Pioneer Road in Rexburg and uh, law enforcement officers presented evidence of that fact, including Nick Balance. Then an overt act alleged about the defendant failing or refusing to contact Social Security Administration is required by law to inform them about Tylee Ryan's death. That was testified to again by Mark Sari, a Social Security investigator, and also continuing allegation of the defendant continuing to receive monthly Social Security payments 
on behalf of Tylee Ryan. Evidence there again from the Social Security investigator Mark Sari and also um, Detective Chuck Consitis testified to some of those bank records as well. So as to the allegations and overt acts in count one, the conspiracy the court finds there is sufficient evidence in considering uh, all reasonable inferences in favor of the prosecution to deny the Rule 29 motion on that count. On count two, <clears throat> the count of first degree murder with malice of forethought, evidence came in supporting the allegation of the date range of honor about September 8th, 2019 to September 9th, 2019. As it relates to the death of Tylee Ryan, <clears throat> photographs were admitted through more than one of the witnesses about the last known proof of life date. Um, Nicholas Edwards provided testimony on that issue. There were text messages brought in um, purporting to show communications between the defendant and Chad Daybell about light and dark ratings, death percentage ratings, and other information that would um, support the malice of forethought element included in that. And going back to the analysis and evidence that I went through on count one of the conspiracy, the court finds on balance that there is sufficient evidence to deny the criminal rule 29 motion as it relates to count two of the amended indictment. On count three, the conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. The court also considered the evidence. Much of it overlaps with the evidence I've already indicated relating to count one. Um, in addition, there was a date range of honor about September 23rd, 2019, uh, about Alex Cox taking possession of J.J. Vallow. That was established through some testimony of Melanie Gibb and David Warwick, who were there at the residence in Rexburg, also establishing the defendant's presence there. And then information on the overt acts about providing false information um, to about the location of J.J. Vallow during a law enforcement investigation. Uh, there was body cam footage of Officer Dave Stubbs talking about a welfare check in Idaho, and other law enforcement officers presented evidence to support that overt act allegation. And finally, um, the allegation in an overt act that on or between September 9th, 2019 and February 1st, 2020, the defendant continued to wrongfully collect Social Security payments. Uh, going back again to Social Security investigator Mark Sari, evidence was provided uh, as well as um, bank records that came in to support that particular allegation. So on count three, the court will deny the motion under criminal rule 29. Count four is the first degree murder with malice forethought. And again, incorporating the evidence I've already reviewed and considered in light of counts one through three, find that many of those dates and uh, elements were established. There was um, evidence brought in on the date ranges, the uh, malice of forethought, again, going back to the text messages and communications that came in in evidence to support the state's theory that there was malice of forethought with uh, the planning of or allegations of planning of um, the murder as alleged as to J.J. Jackson, incorporating all of those prior findings. The court finds there's sufficient evidence under count four for the matter to go forward to the jury. Count five is the conspiracy to commit first degree murder as it relates to Tamara Tammy Daybell. Um, this uh, alleges that on or about October 1st, 2018 through January 15, 2020 are the dates in the conspiracy for that charge and much of the conspiracy evidence again overlaps with counts one and three. 
looking at that evidence as well as on the dates in here specifically as it relates to the death of Tamara Daybell. The court would note that um, Detective Bruce Mattingly established the dates through testimony. There were 911 calls that were admitted establishing dates made by Chad Daybell and Garth Daybell. There were records of those from the dispatchers. The dates of her death were established through testimony of the Fremont County Coroner Brenda Dye and Deputy Coroner Cami Wilmore. There were, again, text messages entered into evidence between the defendant and Chad Daybell about Tamara Daybell being dark and a text that Chad Daybell said, I feel she will be gone soon. Doug Hart, also an FBI agent, testified about those text messages and locations of Alex Cox in and around the Daybell residence at the time of a purported attempted shooting. There was evidence by Detective Chuck Consitis about the burner phone over at act allegations that are contained in that count. In regards to allegations in the overt acts about an application to increase life insurance to the maximum amount allowed, there was testimony from Taylor Ballard from an insurance company and a school employee, Angela Yancey, talking about insurance. Also uh, admitted into the evidence in the case were internet searches relating to the rifle recovered in a storage unit, the Grendel rifle, which is also an exhibit in the case, and those Google searches came in as evidence as well to support those overt acts relating to that count of the case. And with all the cell phone data and messages admitted, there is sufficient evidence the court finds to establish the overt acts that were alleged in count five of the amended indictment. So the Rule 29 motions denied on that count. Finally, on grand theft count seven, the court looked at the elements of that offense as alleged. Um, Mark Sari from the Social Security Administration established uh, dates of these payments and benefits and also importantly established through testimony that there was a legal requirement for certain things to be notified, uh, required notifications if there was a uh, death of a beneficiary or a change of residence or a remarriage and all of those events it was testified occurred and were not reported to the Social Security Administration and there were evidence submitted through law enforcement officers and records also of continued and receipt of payments through the Social Security uh, benefits that were assigned to deceased persons which is sufficient to establish the theory of theft by deception as alleged by the state relating to that grand theft count, uh, which in this case is count seven of the amended indictment. So again, when construing all the reasonable inferences in favor of uh, the state, the court does find, uh, and without any specific argument on any particular element or any charge, that the state's presented enough evidence for this matter to move forward and be considered by the jury. So the court is going to deny the Rule 29 motion and allow for the matter to go forward to the jury on all counts. That will be the court's ruling on the Rule 29 motion. Does the defense have any questions on that ruling? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Any questions from the state? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. With that in mind, then, uh, the next matter we will bring up is we'll have the jurors brought in to read them uh, final instructions.
while we're wait, waiting for the jurors to be brought in, I'll just note on the record that yesterday we did go through jury instructions with counsel. The court did finalize those jury instructions. I've provided a courtesy copy to the attorneys, as well as each juror will receive a courtesy copy of the uh, jury instructions as permitted through Criminal Rule 24.1b. And so the court will go through the reading of those final instructions once the jurors come in. And then uh, we'll start with the closing arguments after that. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. The court will note the jurors are all present and accounted for properly seated. I believe they've all signed their juror affirmation as well. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've now been provided copies of the jury instructions in this case. The court's going to read through those instructions, and if you'd like, you can follow along in your copy. You don't need to, but uh, you may. The court will note that there are a total of 39 instructions. Instructions 1 through 10 have already been read to you. Those were read at the beginning of the trial. There are a few of those that I would like to read again as we start, and then we'll read through instructions 11 onward. So. A few of the preliminary instructions that I would like to go back over with you. We'll start with jury instruction number four. So jury instruction number four. Under our law and system of justice, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. The presumption of innocence means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove her innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. We'll next read instruction number five. A defendant in a criminal trial has a constitu constitutional right not to be compelled to testify. The decision whether to testify is left to the defendant acting with the advice and assistance of the defendant's lawyer you must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant may not testify, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. All right, I'll next move up now to jury instruction number 11. You have now heard all the evidence in the case. 
my duty is to instruct you as to the law. You must follow all the rules as I explain them to you. You may not follow some and ignore others. Even if you disagree or don't understand the reasons for some of the rules, you are bound to follow them. If anyone states a rule of law different from any I tell you, it is my instruction that you must follow. Instruction number 12. As members of the jury, it is your duty to decide what the facts are and to apply those facts to the law that I have given you. You are to decide the facts from all the evidence presented in the case. The evidence you are to consider consists of, one, sworn testimony of witnesses, two, exhibits which have been admitted into evidence, and three, any facts to which the parties have stipulated. Certain things you have heard or not or seen are not evidence, including one, arguments and statements by lawyers. The lawyers are not witnesses. What they say in their opening statements, closing arguments, and at other times is included to help you interpret the evidence, but is not evidence. If the facts as you remember them differ from the way the lawyers have stated them, follow your memory. Two, testimony that has been excluded or stricken or which you have been instructed to disregard. Three, anything you may have seen or heard when the court was not in session. Instruction number 13. Each count charges a separate and distinct offense. You must decide each count separately on the evidence and the law that applies to it, uninfluenced by your decision as to any other count. The defendant may be found guilty or not guilty on any or all of the offenses charged. Jury instruction number 14. Evidence has been introduced for the purpose of showing that the defendant committed acts other than that for which the defendant is on trial. At the time this evidence was introduced, you were advised of its limited purpose. Such evidence, if believed, is not to be considered by you to prove the defendant's character character or that the defendant has a disposition to commit crimes. Such evidence may be considered by you only for the limited purpose of proving the defendant's motive, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, or absence of mistake or accident. Instruction number 15. Certain evidence was admitted for a limited purpose. At the time this evidence was admitted, you were admonished that it could not be considered by you for any purpose other than the limited purpose for which it was admitted. This includes those exhibits admitted for demonstrative or illustrative purposes only. Do not consider such evidence for any purpose except the limited purpose for which it was admitted. The following exhibits were admitted only as demonstrative or illustrative exhibits. 6, 10A, 30, 31A, 31B, 69, 76, 84, 85, 86, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 107B, 179A, 179B, 184C, 184D, 184E, 185A, 182A, 182B. These exhibits are available for your review during your deliberations upon your request. Please advise the bailiff by written note of any such request. Cherry instruction number 16. The law makes no distinction between a person who directly participates in the acts constituting a crime and a person who, either before or during its commission, intentionally aids, assists, facilitates, promotes, encourages, counsels, solicits, invites, helps, or hires another to commit a crime with intent to promote or assist in its commission. Both can be found guilty of the crime. Mere presence at, acquiescence in, or silent consent to the planning or commission of a crime is not sufficient to make one an accomplice. Instruction number 17. An act is willful or done willfully when done on purpose. One can act willfully without intending to violate the law, to injure another, 
or to acquire any advantage. Jury instruction number 18. A witness who has special knowledge in a particular matter may give an opinion on that matter. In determining the weight to be given such opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness and the reasons given for the opinion. You are not bound by such opinion. Give it the weight, if any, to which you deem it entitled. Jury instruction 19. The crime of conspiracy, as alleged in counts 1 and 3 of the amended indictment, involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit the crimes of first-degree murder and grand theft by deception. The crime of conspiracy, as alleged in count 5 of the amended indictment, involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit the crime of first-degree murder. They need not agree upon every detail. The agreement may be established in any manner sufficient to show an understanding of the parties to the agreement. It may be shown by evidence of an oral or written agreement or may be implied from the conduct of the parties. Jury instruction number 20. All of the parties to, conspiracy, to a conspiracy need not enter the agreement at the same time. A person who later joins an already formed conspiracy with knowledge of its unlawful purpose is a party to the conspiracy. Instruction number 21. Murder is the killing of a human being with malice aforethought. Instruction number 22. Malice may be express or implied. Malice is expressed when there is manifested a deliberate intention unlawfully to kill a human being. Malice is implied when, one, the killing resulted from an intentional act, two, the natural consequences of the act are dangerous to human life, and three, the act was deliberately performed with knowledge of the danger to and with conscious disregard for human life. When it is shown that a killing resulted from the intentional doing of an act with express or implied malice, no other mental state need be shown to establish the mental state of malice aforethought. The mental state constituting malice aforethought does not necessarily require any ill will or hatred of the person killed. The word aforethought does not imply deliberation or the lapse of time. It only means that the malice must precede rather than follow the act. Jury instruction number 23, to obtain property means to bring about a transfer of an interest in or the possession of the property. Jury instruction number 24, an owner of property is any person who has the right to possession of such property superior to that of the defendant. Jury instruction number 25, person means an individual, corporation, association, public or private corporation, city or other municipality, county, state agency, the state of Idaho, federal agency, or United States of America. Jury instruction number 26. Property means anything of value including labor or services. Jury instruction number 27. A person steals property and commits theft when, with intent to deprive another of property or appropriate the same to the person or to a third party, such person wrongfully takes, obtains, or withholds such property from an owner thereof. Jury instruction number 28. In order for the defendant to be guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception as alleged in count one of the amended indictment, the state must prove each of the following. One, on or about October 26, 2018 to January 15, 2020. Two, in the state of Idaho. Three, the defendant Lori Noreen Vallow with Chad Daybell and or Alex Cox agreed. Four, to commit the crimes of murder in the first degree of Tylee Ryan and grand theft by deception. Five, the defendant intended that the crimes would be committed. Six, one of the parties to the agreement performed at least one of the following acts. A, honor between October 26, 2018 and June 9, 2020, Chad Guy Daybell and Lori Noreen Vallow 
did endorse and espouse religious beliefs for the purpose of encouraging and or justifying the homicide of Tylee Ryan. B. On or about August 16, 2019, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell did change the deposit of Tylee Ryan's Social Security benefits from Tylee Ryan's J.P. Morgan Chase account to deposit money directly into Lori Noreen Vallow's personal BBVA account. C. On or about September 1, 2019, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell did move from Chandler, Arizona to Rexburg, Idaho with Alex Cox, Tylee Ryan, and Joshua Jackson, J.J. Vallow. D. On or about September 8, 2019, Chad Guy Daybell Googled SSW Wind and visited a website entitled What is the Definition of SSW Wind Direction? E. On or about September 9, 2019, Alex Cox did go to 565 Pioneer Road, Apartment 175, Rexburg, Idaho. F. On or between September 9, 2019 and February 1, 2020, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell failed or refused to contact the Social Security Administration as required by law to inform the Social Security Administration of Tylee Ryan's death. G. On or between September 25, 2019 and January 22, 2020, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell did wrongfully continue to collect five monthly Social Security survivor benefits on behalf of Tylee Ryan. Seven, and such act was done for the purpose of carrying out the agreement. If any of the above has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. If each of the above has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. Jury instruction number 29. In order for the defendant to be guilty of first-degree murder, as alleged in count two of the amended indictment, the state must prove each of the following. One, on or about September 8, 2019 to September 9, 2019. Two, in the state of Idaho. Three, the defendant Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell engaged in conduct or did aid, abet, advise, or counsel another to engage in conduct which caused the death of Tylee Ryan. Four, with malice of forethought, and five, the murder was a willful, deliberate, and premeditated killing. Premeditation means to consider beforehand whether or not to kill, I'm sorry, whether to kill or not to kill, and then to decide to kill. There does not have to be any appreciable period of time during which the decision to kill was considered as long as it was reflected upon before the decision was made. A mere unconsidered and rash impulse, even though it includes an intent to kill, is not premeditation. Aiding and abetting is defined as follows. All persons who participate in a crime either before or during its commission by intentionally aiding, abetting, advising, or counseling another to commit the crime with intent to promote or assist in its commission are guilty of the crime. All such participants are considered principals in the commission of the crime the participation of each defendant in the crime must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt any of the elements of one through four above or failed to prove any of the circumstances listed in element five, you must find the defendant not guilty of first degree murder. If you find that elements one through four above have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and you unanimously agree that the state has proven any of the above circumstances under element five beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty of first degree murder. If you find that the state has failed to prove any of the above, you must find the defendant not guilty of first degree murder. If you find that all of the above have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant guilty of first degree murder. Jury instruction number 30. In order for the defendant to be guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception, as alleged in count three of the amended indictment, the state must prove each of the following. One, on or about October 26, 2018 to January 15, 2020. Two, in the state of Idaho. Three, 
the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, Chad Daybell, and or Alex Cox agreed, four, to commit the crimes of murder in the first degree of Joshua Jackson Vallow and grand theft by deception. Five, the defendant intended that the crimes would be committed. Six, one of the parties to the agreement performed at least one of the following acts. A, on or about October 26, 2018 and June 9, 2020, Chad Guy Daybell and Lori Noreen Vallow did endorse and espouse religious beliefs for the purpose of encouraging and or justifying the homicide of J.J. Vallow. B. On or about September 1, 2019, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell did move from Chandler, Arizona to Rexburg, Idaho with Alex Cox, Tylee Ryan, and Joshua Jackson, J.J. Vallow. C. On or about September 23, 2019, Alex Cox did take possession of J.J. Vallow. D. On or about November 26, 2019, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell provided a false and or misleading physical location of J.J. Vallow to law enforcement during a lawful investigation. E. On or between September 23, 2019 and February 1, 2020, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell felt or refused to contact the Social Security Administration as required by law to inform the Social Security Administration of J.J. Vallow's death. F. On or between September 9, 2019 and February 1, 2020, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell did wrongfully continue to collect four monthly Social Security survivor benefits on behalf of J.J. Vallow and four monthly Social Security child and care payments. Seven. And such act was done for the purpose of carrying out the agreement. If any of the above has not been proven guilty or has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. If each of the above has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. Jury instruction number 31. In order for the defendant to be guilty of first degree murder, as alleged in count four of the amended indictment, the state must prove each of the following. One. On or about September 22, 2019 to September 23, 2019. Two, in the state of Idaho. Three, the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell, engaged in conduct or did aid, abet, advise, or counsel another to engage in conduct which caused the death of Joshua Jackson J.J. Vallow. Four, with malice aforethought. And five, the murder was a willful, deliberate, and premeditated killing. Premeditation means to consider beforehand whether to kill or not to kill and then to decide to kill. There does not have to be any appreciable period of time during which the decision to kill was considered as long as it was reflected upon before the decision was made. A mere unconsidered and rash impulse, even though it includes an intent to kill, is not premeditation. Aiding and abetting is defined as follows. All persons who participate in a crime, either before or during its commission, by intentionally aiding, abetting, advising, or counseling another to commit the crime with intent to promote or assist in its commission, are guilty of the crime. All such participants are considered principals in the commission of the crime. The participation of each defendant in the crime must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt any of the elements one through four above or failed to prove any of the circumstances listed in element five, you must find the defendant not guilty of first degree murder. If you find that elements one through four above have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt and you unanimously agree that the state has proven any of the above circumstances under element five beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder. If you find that the state has failed to prove any of the above, you must find the defendant not guilty of first-degree murder. If you find that all of the above have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder. Jury instruction number 32. In order for the defendant to be guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, as alleged in count five of the amended indictment, the state must prove each of the following. One, on or about October 26, 2018 to January 15, 2020. Two, in the state of Idaho. 
Three, the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, Chad Daybell, and or Alex Cox agreed. Four, to commit the crime of murder in the first degree of Tamara Tammy Daybell. Five, the defendant intended that the crime would be committed. Six, one of the parties to the agreement performed at least one of the following acts. A, on or about or between the dates of October 26, 2018 and June 9, 2020, Chad Guy Daybell and Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell did encourage and espouse religious beliefs for the purpose of justifying and or encouraging the homicide of Tamara Tammy Daybell. B. On or about September 1, 2019, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell did move to Rexburg, Idaho with Alex Cox, Tylee Ryan, and Joshua Jackson here and after J.J. Vallow. C. On or about July 30, 2019, Chad and Lori sent text messages to each other regarding death percentages for Tammy and JJ. D. Chad Daybell obtained a burner phone on September 18, 2019. E. Alex Cox obtained a burner phone on October 9, 2019. F. Chad Guy Daybell and Lori Noreen Vallo Daybell sent text messages to each other about Tamara Tammy Daybell being in limbo and Tammy being possessed by a spirit named Viola. G. September 8, 2019, Chad Guy Daybell signed an application along with Tamara Tammy Daybell to increase her life map insurance to the maximum allowed under her policy. H. Alex Cox attempted to shoot Tamara Tammy Daybell on October 9, 2019. I. Alex Cox conducted multiple internet searches between the dates of October 8, 2019 and October 12, 2019 included searches related to Grendel drop and shooting through a Dodge Dakota. <clears throat> J. Alex Cox went to a gun range in the month before October 9, 2019 when the attempted shooting of Tamara Tammy Daybell takes place. K. Alex traveled from Sportsman's Warehouse to the vicinity of the Daybell residence on October 9, 2019. L. Alex was in the church parking lot approximately 2.5 miles from the Daybell residence on the night of October 18, 2019. 7. And such act was done for the purpose of carrying out the agreement. If any of the above has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. If each of the above has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. Jury instruction number 33. There are different forms of theft depending on the manner in which the theft was committed. The defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, a.k.a. Lori Noreen Daybell, is charged in count seven with the theft of Social Security benefits, uh, Social Security funds. The state alleges that such theft was committed either by taking, withholding, or detaining said property, or by deception. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt and unanimously agree that the defendant committed the crime of theft, you should find the defendant guilty. You are not required to agree as to which particular form of theft the defendant committed. Jury instruction number 34. In order for the defendant to be guilty of grand theft as alleged in count seven of the amended indictment, the state must prove each of the following. One, on or about the dates of October 1, 2019 to January 22, 2020. Two, in the state of Idaho. Three, the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, obtained or exerted control over Social Security survivor benefits allocated for Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, and Social Security child and care benefits allocated for Lori Noreen Vallow in an amount exceeding $1,000, $1,000 U.S. dollars, to which you funds Lori Noreen Vallow, a.k.a. Lori Noreen Daybell, was not entitled. Four, another person was the owner of such property, Five, the defendant did so by knowingly doing one or more of the following. A, creating or confirming another's impression, which is false and which the defendant did not believe to be true. B, failing to correct a false impression which the defendant previously had created or confirmed. Or C, preventing another 
person from acquiring information relevant to the disposition of the property, or six, the defendant had the intent to deprive the owner of the property or to appropriate the property to the defendant or to some person other than the owner. If any of the above has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant not guilty of grand theft. If each of the above has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant guilty of grand theft. Jury instruction number 35. In this case, you will return a verdict consisting of a series of questions. Although the explanations on the verdict form are self-explanatory, they are part of my instructions to you. I will now read the verdict form to you. It states, we, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn to try the above entitled action for our verdict, unanimously answer the questions submitted to us as follows. Question number one, in regards to count one of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tylee Ryan and grand theft by deception? Then there's a space for not guilty or guilty. Question number two, in regards to count two of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Tylee Ryan, not guilty or guilty? Question number three, in regards to count three of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow and grand theft by deception, not guilty, guilty? Question number four, in regards to count four of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow, not guilty, guilty? Question number five, in regards to count five of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Not guilty, guilty. Question number six, in regards to count seven of the indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of grand theft? Not guilty, guilty. And then there is a date line and a line for the presiding officer. And I'll note that is just a form in your instructions. There will be one actual uh, verdict form. So this is just for instruction purposes. Jury instruction number 36. You have been instructed as to all the rules of law that may be necessary for you to reach a verdict. Whether some of the instructions will apply will depend upon your determination of the facts. You will disregard any instruction which applies to a state of facts which you determine does not exist. You must not conclude from the fact that an instruction has been given that the court is expressing any opinion as to the, fa the facts. Instruction 37. <clears throat> The original instructions and the exhibits will be with you in the jury room with the exception of exhibits 280, Alexander Arms Grendel 6.5 firearm, 278 and 279 firearm baffles and illustrative or demonstrative exhibits. <coughs> For safety and security reasons, the firearm exhibits may be viewed with the assistance of the bailiff if requested by the jury. <coughs> The demonstrative or illustrative exhibits may be available as explained in jury instruction number 15. They are part of the official court record. For this reason, please do not alter them or write or mark on them in any way. Some of the exhibits have been sealed in bags or containers that allow you to view them. Do not open or remove the contents of those exhibits. If you have any questions about the handling or use of the exhibits, submit those questions in writing to me through the bailiff. The instructions are numbered for convenience in referring to specific instructions. There may, <coughs> excuse me, there may or may not be a gap in the numbering of the instructions. <coughs> if there is, you should not concern yourselves about such gap.
Instruction 38. Upon retiring to the jury room, select one of you as a presiding officer who will preside over your deliberations. It is that person's duty to see that the discussion is orderly, that the issues submitted for your decision are fully and fairly discussed, and that every juror has a chance to express himself or herself upon each question. In this case, your verdict must be unanimous. <clears throat> When you arrive, when you all arrive at a verdict, the presiding officer will sign it and you will return it into open court. Your verdict in this case cannot be arrived at by chance, by lot, or by compromise. If after considering all the instructions in their entirety and after having fully discussed the evidence before you, the jury determines that it is necessary to communicate with me, you may send a note by the bailiff. You are not to reveal to me or anyone else how the jury stands until you have reached a verdict or unless you are instructed by me to do so. A verdict form suitable to any conclusion you may reach will be submitted to you with these instructions. Instruction 39, I have outlined for you the rules of law applicable to this case and have told you of some of the matters which you may consider in weighing the evidence to determine the facts. In a few minutes, counsel will present their closing remarks to you and then you will retire to the jury room for your deliberations. The arguments and statements of the attorneys are not evidence. If you remember the facts differently from the way the attorneys have stated them, you should base your decision on what you remember. The attitude and conduct of jurors at the beginning of your deliberations are important. It is rarely productive at the outset for you to make an emphatic expression of your opinion on the case or to state how you intend to vote. When you do that at the beginning, your sense of pride may be aroused and you may hesitate to change your position even if shown it is wrong. Remember that you are not partisans or advocates, but you are judges. For you, as for me, there can be no triumph except in the ascertainment and declaration of the truth. As jurors, you have a duty to consult with one another and to deliberate before making your individual decisions. You may fully and fairly discuss among yourselves all the evidence you have seen and heard in this courtroom about the case together with the law that relates to this case is contained in these instructions. During your deliberations, you each have a right to re-examine your own views and change your opinion. You should only do so if you are convinced by fair and honest discussion that your original opinion was incorrect based upon the evidence the jury saw and heard during the trial and the law as given you in these instructions. Consult with one another, consider each other's views and deliberate with the objective of reaching an agreement. If you can do so without disturbing your individual judgment, each of you must decide this case for yourself, but you should do so only after a discussion and consideration of the case with your fellow jurors. However, none of you should surrender your honest opinion as to the weight or effect of the evidence or as to the innocence or guilt of the defendant because the majority of the jury feels otherwise or for the purpose of returning a unanimous verdict. All right, having concluded then the reading of the instructions, uh, this will be the time for closing arguments. Is the state ready to proceed with its closing? Yes, Your Honor. And who will be presenting closing? I will. All right, Mr. Wood then, uh, you can commence with your closing. Your Honor, may we just have a very brief sidebar before we start? Yes. Council, we had a sidebar uh, to discuss scheduling quickly. We are going to go ahead and take a brief recess before we start with the closing arguments. So we'll let the jurors have a break as well. All right, please.
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, let's have the jurors brought in, please. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. At this time, we'll have closing arguments. Mr. Wood for the state. Money, power, and sex. Beginning in, in October of 2018, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell set in motion a series of events that led to three horrific murders in the state of Idaho. Along their way, they quickly recruited and groomed her brother Alex Cox to participate in their multiple conspiracies. Each of these conspiracies as part of a larger plan for Chad and Lori to be together, unencumbered and free of obstacles. This plan was driven by Lori Vallow's desire for and use of money, power, and sex. And this plan that she set in motion must end today in the verdicts you render in this trial. Idaho murder number one, Tylee Ryan. Tylee was Lori Vallow's 16-year-old vibrant daughter. She had a whole life ahead of her. Tylee was murdered between September 8th and September 9th, 2019. Lori Vallow was responsible 
for Tylee's health and safety. But instead of protecting her, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, and Alex Cox conspired to murder her. Acting together, they caused her death. Tylee's body was burned beyond recognition. Her body was dismembered in such a grotesque and extreme manner that the medical examiner had to determine the cause of death as homicide by unspecified or unknown means. She was burned and buried in Chad Daybell's backyard on September 9, 2019. What was left of her body they dumped in a green bucket and buried in a pet cemetery on top of a piece of her skull. Tylee was gone and buried and out of the way, but Lori Vallow kept collecting Tylee's money. Tylee Ryan had been receiving social security benefits from the death of her father, and Lori personally took steps to make sure that she kept receiving that money after Tylee was murdered. Lori never reported that Tylee was missing or dead. Not only did she not report it, she lied to multiple people about Tylee's location and whereabouts, including to the police. She had to keep her body hidden so she could keep getting the money. Idaho murder number two. Between September 22nd and 23rd, 2019, J.J. Vallow's voice was silenced forever by a strip of duct tape placed across his mouth. A white plastic bag was placed over his head where it was secured tightly with duct tape being wrapped around and around from his forehead to his neck. The evidence shows he struggled and will never know how long he fought before they bound his wrists, his forearms, and his ankles with duct tape. That white bag that was placed over his head, that was duct taped over his head, cut off his airways. So he stopped breathing. His heart stopped beating, and he died. It was a brutal, horrific murder of a seven-year-old boy with special needs. A seven-year-old boy with special needs. JJ's body was placed in a black plastic and buried like a piece of trash in Chad Daybell's backyard. In a shallow but well-prepared and precise grave. Just like Tylee. J.J. was the recipient of Social Security benefits from the death of his father, Charles Vallow. Just like Tylee, Lori never reported that J.J. was missing or dead. Why? He had to remain hidden so she could keep receiving the money. Not only did she not report, she lied to multiple people about his location. She even asked a friend, Melanie Gibb, to lie to the police about J.J.'s location and further asked her to falsify evidence of his location. Just like Tylee, after J.J. was murdered, she kept collecting the money. Idaho murder number three. Between the night of October 19th and the morning of October 20th, or during the night of October 18th and October 20th, 2019, Tammy Daybell, a loving, active, healthy 49-year-old mother of five and a, a school librarian, was murdered in her own home. She was asphyxiated in her own home. The evidence is clear that Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, and Alex Cox conspired to murder Tammy. 
acting together, they caused her death. Her death occurred just a little over a week after a masked gunman had attempted to shoot her. She entered her home after a night of church activities. When their first plan didn't work, they formed a second plan, and she was asphyxiated. Lori was conveniently gone for both the attempted murder and the successful murder. She was conveniently out of the state. Those trips were not coincidences. And just like Tylee and JJ, there was money to be gained from Tammy's death. $430,000 worth of life insurance. And Lori wasted no time in making sure she could benefit from that money. A mere two and a half weeks after Tammy Daybell died on November 5th, 2019, Lori Vallow married, Cherry, married Ch Chad Daybell on a beach in Hawaii. So less than two months after Tylee and JJ are murdered and within weeks of Tammy's murder, Lori and Chad are on a beach, in the words of her sister, dancing on a beach in Hawaii. Free from the obstacles that were Tylee, JJ, and Tammy, but living with the money that was gained from each of their deaths. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to quickly talk to you about the timeline of this case. The timeline tells the truth, and Lori Vallow is convicted by the timeline she created. She meets Chad in October of 2018. You have seen plenty of evidence of the affair that took place after they met. July 11th, 2019, Lori's brother, Alex, shoots and kills Charles Vallow, Lori's husband. September 8th and 9th, Tylee Ryan, Lori Vallow's daughter, is killed. September 22nd to 23rd, J.J. Vallow, her son, is killed. October 19th, 2019, Tammy Daybell is killed. These are not coincidences. And there is one common thread through these murders. Lori Vallow. She is the one person who ties these all together. You heard about the investigation and how it got started. Looking for a Jeep that was used in an attempted shooting at Brandon Boudreaux on October 2nd. You heard about Chad and the life insurance. They're married November 5th. You heard about how the Rexburg police got a call looking for JJ towards the end of November. And that kicks off the investigation looking for JJ and Tylee, how they searched the apartments. And how finally, through their investigation, the bodies of Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallow were found on June 9th. Tammy's body was exhumed on December 11th. Alex Cox died December 12th. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to speak with you about the law a little bit. And I, the judge already read it to you. And I'm not going to go through and read it to you again. But there's some things that are important to point out. And so in the jury instructions, you have them. You don't need to turn to them. But as you go back and deliberate, there's things we want you to think about. In jury instruction number 28, which is what you, the elements you need to find to establish that Lori Vallow is guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and grand theft against Tylee Ryan. Some of those things are easy. The dates, the state of Idaho, those are incontrovertible. Conspiracy comes down to this is a crime of agreement. Did Lori agree 
to have Tylee killed and to steal that money? Did she intend for those events to actually happen? And did someone, any of the conspirators, perform an overt act in furtherance of that agreement? Now, as you read the, as you read the jury instructions and you read over the overt acts, it'll be number six in your instruction. It is that one of the parties to the agreement performed at least one of the following acts. So when it comes to conspiracy, what you need to ask yourself, who murdered these people? Did Lori conspire for these murders and for these thefts? Did she intend for it to happen? And did one of these overt acts, was one of these overt acts accomplished in furtherance of the conspiracy. As it says, you only need to find one overt act. The state has met its burden for each of the overt acts. You only need to find one. Turning to jury instruction number 29, which is the actual murder of Tylee Ryan. Because we want to differentiate. There's the crime of conspiracy to murder, which is crime of agreement, and the actual murder. And what you need to ask yourselves, again, on or about certain dates in the state of Idaho, that's incontrovertible. What you need to ask yourself, who killed Tylee Ryan? And did Lori aid, abet, advise, or counsel that murder? Did she encourage that murder? You remember in voir dire when you were all asked and you all raised your hand about the question, someone is proven to have aided or abetted, would, could you still find them guilty? Under the law, under the law, if you find that Lori aided, abetted, advised, or counseled, you must find her guilty. Jury instruction 29 is the conspiracy for JJ. You need to go over those same questions. Who killed him? Did Lori conspire to that? Did she agree to JJ being killed? Did she intend for it to happen? And did one of those overt acts happen in furtherance of that agreement? 31 is the murder of JJ. Again, remember to separate the crimes of conspiracy from the crime of murder. Instruction 32 is the conspiracy on Tammy. Again, who killed her? Did Lori agree to it? Was there an overt act taken in furtherance of that? And the final, instruction 34, the grand theft. find her guilty, you need to find that she deprived the United States of money that belonged to them and not her. You can find it by two ways, that she deceived them or that she just intended to keep the money. That's a summary of the jury instructions, ladies and gentlemen. When you go back to deliberate, read them carefully. And as you do, you will find that the state has met its burden of proving these elements each and every one of them, beyond a reasonable doubt. A few things to consider. This is just a portion of the definition of reasonable doubt taken directly out of your jury instruction. Follow the jury instruction. Read the whole jury instruction. But I want to point out, a reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It's not something you make up. It's a doubt based on reason and common sense. Reason and common sense. So ladies and gentlemen, as you go back and deliberate, and you consider these elements, and you consider these crimes that were committed, use your reason and your common sense. Malice. It's one of those words 
that may mean something out in the normal world and in court may mean something a little bit different. Follow the jury instruction. Malice can be expressed where someone says they want this to happen. It can be implied. You will find express and implied malice in this case. There is an abundance of malice. Aiding and abetting, again, already went over this, but any person who aids and abets, who assists, facilitates, promotes, or encourages a crime to happen is just as guilty as anyone else involved in the crime. Aiding and abetting is just the same as pulling the trigger. Overt acts. As I mentioned, you need to find on a conspiracy that at least one overt act was committed. You need to find at least one overt act beyond a reasonable doubt. In your jury instructions, there's a list, and we're going to go over them in a second. You need to find that one of those acts was done for the purpose of carrying out the agreement. Overt acts do not need to be, in and of themselves, illegal. Remember that. They don't need to be illegal. But if it's an act done in furtherance of the conspiracy, then it is an overt act and makes it a part of the crime. Let's quickly go through the overt acts. We're not going to discuss them a lot. That's for you to do when you get back in deliberations. But in regards to Tylee, JJ, and Tammy, Lori is charged with endorsed endorsing and espousing religious beliefs for the purpose of encouraging and or justifying murder. To be clear, no one here has been charged because of their religious beliefs. They are charged for using those, uh, those beliefs for the purpose of justifying murder. In terms of Tylee, Lori Vallow on or around August 16, 2019, changed the, secu the, the deposit for the Social Security benefits to go from Tylee's J.P. Morgan account to Lori's personal BBVA account. You saw that evidence. In regards to the conspiracies on Tylee, J.J., and Tammy, Lori Vallow, along with Alex Cox, Tylee Ryan, and Joshua Jackson Vallow, J.J. Vallow, moved from Arizona to Rexburg. Why is that important? Why is that an overt act? They couldn't kill the kids in Arizona where they had friends and family. Moving to Rexburg was the catalyst for these murders. They had to hide Tylee and JJ. They had to go somewhere where nobody knew them. So moving to Rexburg furthered the conspiracy to kill Tylee and JJ, and it brought Alex Cox to where he could kill and help kill Tammy Daybell. In regards to Tylee's conspiracy, Chad Daybell googled South Southwest Wind and visited the website. What's the definition of South Southwest Wind? In regards to Tylee, you heard evidence in the early morning hours of September 9th, Alex Cox went to 565 Pioneer Road, apartment 175. That was Lori's apartment. Also in regards to Tylee, that Lori failed or refused to contact Social Security to let, her, let them know of Tylee's death. And that she continued to wrongfully collect those Social Security benefits. In regards to J.J., on September 23rd, Alex Cox took JJ. He took custody of him. In, uh, also in regards to JJ, November 26, 2019, Lori Vallow provided a false and or misleading physical location of JJ to the police. You saw that on video. Also in regards to JJ, September 23rd, 2000, or 20th through the 19th, that she failed or refused to contact Social Security to inform them of J.J.'s death. 
Why? To further the conspiracy of grand theft, to keep the money. And that she continued to collect that money, furthering the conspiracy. In regards to the conspiracy to murder Tammy, again, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow espoused or endorsed religious beliefs for the purpose of justifying Tammy's homicide. September 1, 2019, again, they moved to Rexburg. I've already spoken about that. There were text messages in regards to the conspiracy for Tammy between Chad and Lori regarding death percentages for Tammy and JJ, July 30th, 2019. Chad Daybell obtained a burner phone on September 18th, 2019. Alex Cox obtained a burner phone October 9th, 2019. All these taken, all these steps taken to further their conspiracy. On, further on Tammy, text messages between Chad and Lori about Tammy being in limbo and Tammy being possessed by a spirit. In regards to Tammy, Chad signed, co-signed a life insurance policy increasing the amount of insurance he would get upon her death. On October 9th, Alex Cox attempted to shoot Tammy. On October that between October 8th and October 12th, Alex Cox conducted multiple internet searches related to Grendel Drop, related to a Dodge Dakota, all in furtherance of the conspiracy to kill Tammy. He goes to gun ranges in furtherance of the conspiracy. He went to Sportsman's Warehouse. You saw what he bought there. And then on the night that Tammy died, Chad, the, Alex Cox goes to a church parking lot just about two and a half miles south of Chad Daybell's house. These are all overt acts. Things done to further the conspiracy. Steps taken to get to murder. Let's talk about some of the digital evidence you've seen in this case. You've heard evidence from Homer J. Maximus at gmail.com, chad.daybell at gmail.com, lollytimeforever at gmail.com, other phone data and iCloud accounts. Let's look now, as we're thinking about these overt acts and the steps taken for murder, what was Alex Cox Googling? On October 1st, the day before Brandon Boudreaux was shot at, he Googles Brandon Boudreaux's address. October 8th, the day before Tammy is shot at, he Googles drop from 100 yards to 300 yards He's figuring out how to sight in his rifle. October 10th, after the failed shooting, in what you heard from the Gilberts, Todd and Alice Gilbert, was an unseasonably cold October. How to prep your AR for the cold. AR-15 cold weather operation. How to help your AR load in the cold. FBI simulation shooting a 5.56 through car doors and walls. Then... 2008 Dodge Dakota still body thickness. You heard testimony that Tammy and Chad had. It was a 2004 Dodge Dakota. But he's figuring out, shooting the still body thickness just the day after he messed up his first attempt on Tammy's life. How to drill baffles to make a suppressor. Chad Daybell. Talking about overt acts again. September 8th, he searched south-southwest wind and visited what is the definition of south-southwest wind direction. Why? Because the next day, he knows he will be burning Tylee Ryan in his fire pit. And he needs to know which way the wind will be blowing. You heard testimony of the officers who searched that account. This is the only time... <coughs> He searches wind direction. The only time. Lori, on lollytimeforever at gmail.com, 825, 2019. She's searching wedding bands made of malachite. Tammy's not dead yet. She's, they've gotten rid of Charles, but Tammy is still alive, and she's already searching for wedding rings. 
9-30-2019, a couple of days before Brandon Boudreaux was shot at from the back of a Jeep Wrangler, how to take the back seat out of my Jeep Wrangler. October 22, 2019, the day that Tammy Daybell is being buried. What is Lori doing? She's looking up wedding dresses, wedding dresses in Kauai. Her boyfriend's wife is being buried that day, and she's already looking for wedding dresses. Let's talk about Tammy Daybell's phone and the text that was recovered from that phone. September 9th, 2019, at 11.53 a.m., Chad Daybell places himself in his own backyard, and he says well, to Tammy, well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all of the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun, and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. Fun times. This text is where Chad Daybell told us where to locate Ty Ryan. This text is where Chad Daybell told us he burnt her limbs. This text was further suspicious. Raccoons in daylight. It's not impossible, but they're nocturnal. And then he buries it in his pet cemetery. You saw the satellite footage of later in the day of September 9th. The disturbance in the ground near the pet cemetery. The day after Tylee Ryan is last seen in Yellowstone National Park. She's never seen again. But she turned up in that pet cemetery that Chad Daybell was talking about that day. He told law enforcement where to find her. There are patterns that emerge through the digital evidence and through these iCloud accounts about Chad and Lori's affair. You've read and you'll have back in deliberations the James and Elena story. Their future together. This was all a plan. Like I said at the beginning, a plan for them to be together without obstacles. Obstacles is the word they used. You learn about the relationship between Chad and Lori and Alex, and how Lori is the conduit of information to Alex. How he does, Alex does what Lori tells him. The plan to remove obstacles, and those obstacles are Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and their spouses, Charles Vallow and Tammy Daybell. And you also start seeing the need for money, how this revolves around money. I'm going to remind you about Colby Ryan's testimony her son's own testimony that every two to three months, Lori would tell him, we're out of money. So it was a concern for her. In terms of the digital evidence, one of the overt acts is that on September 9th, Alex Cox went to Lori's apartment. You see here, September 9th, from 2.42 a.m. in the morning to 3.37 a.m. in the morning. He goes, Alex Cox, goes to Lori's apartment. Why is that significant? September 8th, the last known sighting of Tylee Ryan. September 9th, she's buried in Chad Daybell's backyard. That morning, there's a phone call between Chad Daybell and Alex Cox. It's a three minute phone call at 8.11 a.m. By 8.49, Alex Cox is moving. We can track him by his phone. And at 9.15, he's just south of Chad Daybell's residence. These are the hits on GPS, on Alex's phone, on September 9th. From 9.21 to 10.57. Here's the burn pit. 
that Tylee was burned in. Here's Alex's GPS hits right by where Tylee is buried, feet away. Another hit at the gate coming in. Again, within the same time frame as the text from Chad to Tammy about the raccoon. An overt act taken to further the conspiracy of the murder of Ty Ryan and to keep stealing her money. At 1147, Alex is just north of Chad Daybell's residence and heading south. They've done the deed, they've burnt Tylee, they've dismembered her, and they've buried her. And then that, that, that same day, phone calls. You, you saw the full cast report, and you have it, to go, and I encourage you in deliberations to go look at it. Chad calls Lori for three minutes at 11.45 as Alex is leaving. September 23rd. Let's, before we look at this, let's talk about the testimony you heard about September 23rd. Melanie Gibb and David Warwick spent the weekend of September 22nd and 23rd with Lori Vallow in her apartment. Melanie tells... Excuse me. Lori tells Melanie, J.J. is a zombie. He's acting totally different. Using a religious belief to justify his death. An overt act. On the morning of the 23rd, David Warwick inquires of Lori, where's J.J.? She tells him that he's been climbing up the cabinets and the refrigerator. So she sent him with Alex Cox. An overt act. Alex Cox took possession and custody of JJ that morning. <clears throat> we can see that until from 9.01 to 9.41, Alex is in his apartment on September 23rd. There's a phone call, a 38-second phone call from Chad Daybell to Alex Cox that morning. 38 seconds at 9.25. By 9.45, Alex is again on his way to Chad Daybell's house. This time with J.J. Vallow in tow. September 23rd. Here's Alex's phone. Mere feet from where J.J. was buried. Last known sighting of J.J., September 22nd, he was never seen again. No matter how many tips the police followed up on, they never found him. They never found Tylee until they found him here, where Alex's phone was, was being hit by GPS. He shows up, the first is at 9.55. At 10.12, he appears to be leaving on a Wi-Fi hit. So about 17 minutes. That grave was not dug in 17 minutes. That grave was too precise. It was too well prepared. This was planned. This was premeditated murder. Lori encouraged it. She aided it. She handed her boy off to Alex Cox. And then Alex Cox, at 1012, heads back south to Rexburg. a lot of electronic devices in this case. You heard about a lot of electronic devices. This one is significant. Chad Daybell, on October 9th, activates a new phone. In a, in a text to Lori from his old phone number, his normal phone number, he says, I will call right now from a 401 number. That was at 1026. Oops, went the wrong way. 1027. He's calling from the, the new 401 number. Let's talk about the digital evidence on October 9th. 
the day Tammy was shot at. Alex, from 12 to 1.23 p.m., he's at his sister's house. <coughs> you saw the evidence. He goes to Sportsman's Warehouse. You saw what he bought, the black mask, the mittens, the black pants. That afternoon, this is one of the overt acts. He goes up and travels by Chad Daybell's residence. You can follow his phone. as he scopes out the property again. And then he drives back past it. And then you remember seeing the evidence that his, his phone that night stayed at his apartment. Here's some of the digital data from that day. Six texts between Chad and Lori between 528 and 703. Between 7.13 and 8.43, 15 texts between Alex and Chad. Again, ask yourself, what ties Alex to Chad? Lori Vallow. You remember Zulema Pastena's testimony that night, about that night. She hears Lori get off of a phone call and angrily proclaim, he can't do anything right because he failed. He failed when he tried to kill Tammy that night. October 18th, the night of the successful murder. Between 10.05 p.m. and 10.07, Alex Cox is traveling north. From 10.07 to 10.45, his phone is tracked at the Salem Church. This is just approximately 2.5 miles south of Chad Daybell's house. This is the night Tammy dies. This is the night Tammy was murdered. And you see some of the digital activity. Ten text messages between Alex and Chad between 10.23 and 10.54. At 11.28, an image is deleted off of Tammy's phone. 11.34 to 11.35, Chad sends two texts to Lori. 11.46, Alex leaves the parking lot. 11.53 to 12.09, Alex calls Lori. Remember where Lori is. She's in Hawaii. On purpose, not a coincidence. And here's that call from Alex to Lori. And here's her receiving it in Hawaii. Let's talk about the crime scene, Chad Daybell's residence. For some reason this isn't coming through. You've seen this exhibit. You have all the pictures of this exhibit. I encourage you to take them back in deliberations and look at them. Upon discovering the raccoon text, upon reviewing Alex Cox's digital data, law enforcement serves a warrant June 9th, 2020 on Chad Daybell's residence. You remember multiple officers testifying to you of watching Chad Daybell in that front yard, sitting in his car, nervously looking over his shoulder to the location where Tylee was buried. You heard a phone call that morning from Chad and Lori that was recorded. They're searching the property. And you can hear the fear and the guilt in both of their voices. They know what's about to happen. On that crime scene, the fire pit.
This is how it was found by law enforcement that day. And you heard testimony, how they removed the debris. They raked it. They sifted that ground, and they found pieces of Tylee Ryan in that fire pit. They found this chain in that fire pit. They found this charm that's also located on State's Exhibit 6, being worn by Tylee Ryan. Just approximately 30 feet from that fire pit. And the pet cemetery. Again, you saw satellite footage that same day of the disturbance in the ground. You saw how law enforcement, they started their search. They found a dog and a cat. They moved north. They found what they thought might be a human bone. And they continued to dig. And this is what they found. This is what was left of Tylee Ryan. Charred flesh, dismembered. They came back the next day and found this bucket. You heard the testimony of multiple officers talk about how it felt like this ground had concrete or quickery in it. It was hard, and they had to finally use the backhoe to pull it off to get to this bucket. And when they finally did, they found this material that was Tylee Ryan. And again, sitting on top of a piece of her skull. That's not the only place they found Tylee Ryan that day, though. They also found pieces of her here, in the shed. You heard how law enforcement searched the shed for tools that could be used in the commission of these crimes. These shovels, this pickaxe, were of particular interest to them. You heard testimony of this pickaxe, how it was taken to the Idaho State Lab, how in the eye of that pickaxe there was material that looked different than the dirt, so it was separated out. It was tested for DNA. It was tested against a profile of Tylee, and it was Tylee in the eye of the pickaxe. This shovel, you heard how on the back of this kick, the kick plate of that shovel, there was a piece of material that looked like it could be organic material. Again, it was tested for DNA, and it matched to Tylee Ryan. There was blood on the handle, tested, and it matched for Tylee Ryan. You heard testimony of how Agent Doug Hart was the first person to find this piece of ground, a mound. The vegetation was lower. You heard how he'd had training to find clandestine graves. You heard how he put his hand on the ground and felt the seam of the sod that had been removed, that he tried to probe it, and his probe wouldn't go through. And why? because they found this, meticulously placed rocks and boards. You heard the testimony of multiple officers about the smell emanating. And they began to see what they thought was a human head. They checked it, there was human hair. Look at this grave. The roots are cut. It's just the right size for J.J. Vallow. This was prepared in advance. This was a premeditated murder. The day was, the, was dug. J.J. was murdered. You heard testimony. Again, Lori Vallow handed J.J. off to Alex Cox.
Tylee, JJ, and Tammy can't tell us what happened, but their bodies do. You heard testimony about the testing that was done on Tylee. One, they had to do DNA testing just to identify her because she was too broken up and too dismembered. You heard Dr. Christensen and Mr. Halapaska talk about puncture wounds in her pelvis, how those wounds were not the wounds of dismemberment. They're separate wounds in her pelvis. J.J. Vallow, gagged and bound. Tammy's body, bruises consistent with restraint, homicide by asphyxiation. This is Tylee. Here are the marks talked, to, talked about by Dr. Christensen and Mr. Halapaska. That's not where she's being dismembered. Mr. Halapaska said those marks are consistent with stabbing. The white bag over JJ's face, the duct tape that blocked his airway. We know how he died. He was asphyxiated. He was bound with duct tape. A seven-year-old boy with special needs. Tammy's autopsy, you heard from, you heard from the medical examiner for the state of Utah. She was exhumed. You heard about the extensive toxolog uh, toxology they did. They found nothing. They found nothing in her that would have killed her. Her internal were healthy. Her brain was normal. There was nothing in her body that would have killed her. She had bruises on her arms. Remember, JJ had bruises on his arms, too. She had bruises on her arms that the ME stated were consistent with restraint. She was murdered by asphyxiation. We told you this was about money, power, and sex. We talked a lot about religion, but this is not a case about religion. It's about money and power and sex. Let's talk about the money for a minute. Lori learned a lesson with Charles Vallow. The lesson she learned was to make sure you get the money coming to you before you commit the murder. She thought she was going to get the insurance money. She texted Chad about it. I talked to the insurance company. He changed it in March. So it was probably Ned. Remember, Ned was one of the other names for Charles before we got rid of him. I'll still get the $4,000 a month. So within a week of killing Charles Vallow, she's already talking about the Social Security she's going to get. It was planned. Tylee Ryan's Social Security. Tylee Ryan started collecting Social Security in June of 2018 when her father died. She collected it monthly. On July 11th, Charles Vallow dies. August 12th through the 20th, I believe the date was August 16th, Ty Lori Vallow changes the deposit on Tylee's Social Security. Tylee was receiving her own money. You heard testimony about her spending habits. She was paying for her Jeep. She bought fast food. She lived like a normal teenager. And then Lori takes that money and starts putting it into her own BBVA account. Because she learned her lesson. She gets the payment on August 28th. September 8th, Tylee dies. She made sure to get the money before she killed Tylee. J.J. Vallow. He collects Social Security after Charles Vallow dies. He collects it as a survivor, and she collects it as a parent in care of a survivor. Again, get the money and then commit the murder. Last proof of life for J.J. is 920. Well, the first deposit, September 18th, 2019, 
Days later, JJ is dead and murdered and buried in Chad Daybell's backyard. She made sure to get the money first. She collected multiple payments. By the way, while we're here, let's talk about grand theft. What do you need to find to find her guilty of grand theft? That she either used deceit to take money that did not belong to her, or that with the intent to possess that money, she took money that did not belong to her. After this date, she has no right to any of this money. She failed to report. What's the amount you need to find for grand theft? It's $1,000. Ladies and gentlemen, if you find between any of these payments and any of these payments that Lori Vallow collected $1,000 she was not entitled to with the intent to keep it, you must find her guilty of grand theft. There are the benefits of murder. She thought she was getting one million from life insurance from Charles. Chad got $430,000 in life insurance from Tammy. From Tylee, she began to collect $1,859 per month in Social Security into her own account. From JJ, $1,951, and as her parent in care, $1,951. Remember Zulima Pastena's testimony when she asked Lori how they were going to finance this gathering that she kept talking about, she said, Melanie Boudreaux will take care of us all. Brandon Boudreaux was shot at. Brandon Boudreaux had a life insurance policy. Money is the motive for murder. Power. Let's talk about religion for one second because we've heard a lot about religion. It does not matter what they believed. It matters what they did. They can believe whatever they want. But when they use that to justify homicide, that changes. They used religion as a tool to manipulate others. Lori manipulated Alex Cox through religion. She manipulated Chad through emotional and sexual control. They manipulated their friends through this use of, of religion. Let's talk about how she groomed Alex Cox. Ladies and gentlemen, you have multiple iCloud conversations in evidence that you can review in deliberations. I encourage you to do so. I'm not going to read everything here, but let's look at some of the things Lori said. March 20th, she says to Alex, I'm finding out some great stuff about you. I learned about you. You're going to like it. We can talk about it. How does he respond? Okay, hurry, please. He's eager for the knowledge. She says, we can talk about it tomorrow, hopefully. They moved to Rexburg. He's going to go side in his rifles. Fun. You need the practice. Lori Vallow is telling Alex Cox what to do. In these messages, you never see Alex tell her what to do. He's telling her what to do. She's telling him what to do. They have a conversation about JJ and a boy named Zach. And he says, my lip sealed. How does she respond? Good boy. Learning more. I'll fill you in in the afternoon. Again, she's the conduit of information to Alex. Remember what Alex's wife, Zulema Pastena, said. He believed all of it. Where does he get it? He gets it from Lori. Why does she give it to him? To justify murder. You, you heard from Zulema Pastanis. You heard from Melanie Gibb, the description about castings, these uh, descriptions of light and dark scales. You heard a lot about it. The only reason it matters, the only reason it matters is because it's the tool they used to manipulate others. They used it to manipulate Melanie Boudreaux. They used it to manipulate Zulema, Melanie Gibb, Alex Cox. Again, who is the common thread here? 
It's Lori Vallow. We talked about sex in this case, how it was a motive, their affair, how they had to remove obstacles so they could be together. Those conversations often turn sexual. Always talking about their future together, their plan to be together. A conversation on July 14th between Chad and Lori where he wants to kiss her for hours and it would lead, likely lead to other activities. And she says likely or luckily, luckily lead to nakedness. Again, their conversations. He's saying she's incredible. Their mission has barely begun. Her mission has barely begun. As long as it ends with you, it's all good. Wish I could be see with you and be cheek to cheek. Lori uses sex to manipulate Chad. And Chad seeks confirmation from Lori repeatedly. July 13th, he's having a conversation with her about when they can spend time together and about Tammy's passing. And at the end, what does he say? Please ask about that. He's asking her to confirm. Why? Because Lori and Chad are driving this together. It's their plan to be together, to get rid of the obstacles. Chad tells Lori that he's been instructed to focus his efforts on Hillary, who you heard from testimony in other places in the iCloud is established as Tylee Ryan. What does Lori say? She doesn't say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't kill my kids. She says, okay, find out her percentage for me and JJ's. And when Chad talks about Tylee's low death percentage, meaning she's close to death, and how JJ needs to follow Amy into the light, ladies and gentlemen, we all know what it means to go into the light. He's talking about a young boy's death. And he assured JJ that Chad would be there, James would love and take care of his mommy. Because JJ is going to be gone, because he's followed someone in the light. And how does she respond? Again, she doesn't say, maybe we shouldn't kill my kids. That is sweet. I miss you desperately. She wants these children gone. There is no doubt. She wants these children gone. She is encouraging their murder. July 23rd. She asked Chad, need you to check JJ. When you get home, check Tylee. She's being super sweet and helpful. And she cleaned a room. She got, she has got, she got switched. Totally not her. See if she got switched. Again, they're using this religion, even amongst themselves, to justify murder. And she's encouraging it. This isn't fantasy. Those children were found in real life dead in Chad Daybell's backyard. Again, 726, 2019. In response to a text from Chad, need you to check JJ. She said he was calm and he watched movies all day, which she would never do. Justification for murder. This isn't JJ. Justification. She's encouraging. She's aiding. This text removes any doubt that they are talking about murder. From Chad to Lori, 7-30-2019. I got the inspiration to go back to my original death percentages that helped us track Charles. Not me, us. Charles, Ned, etc. What happened to Charles? Charles got shot in the chest by Alex Cox. Tammy is very close. So after he's talking about death percentages to track Charles, Tammy is close. They are talking about murdering Tammy. Her percentage has fallen. It is encouraging. And how does she respond? What is the percentage now? And then, what about JJ's too? So on July 30th, she's already planning for JJ to go the same way as Charles, to be murdered. 
Chad responds, Tammy is at three, JJ is at two. Both are being heavily shielded to stop intruder. And what does she say? She doesn't say, maybe we shouldn't kill children. She says, two and three percent, not zero. She wants the children gone. He says he'll explain when they talk. And this is sexual manipulation. Okay, still feeling hot for you. He's telling her what she wants to hear. She reinforces him with sexual behavior. Again, this is in the iCloud. I encourage you to go look at it. Here, it's a continuation of that conversation. Yes, we might need to release a little steam when we talk. Anyway, this is the chart that checks what percentage of mortals are still in their body. It worked for my wife's friend who died, a real person. My neighbor, a real person. George Bush, Stanley, real people. This isn't fantasy. They're talking about the deaths of real people. This afternoon, Tammy said she felt lightheaded, as if her body and spirit weren't connected. They're talking about Tammy's death. Again, Lori, not, this is at Lori's initiation. Please check JJ. She's asking him to check for these death percentages. He says JJ is still JJ. Is he at zero yet? August 10th. Six weeks later, he's dead. August 10th, is he at zero? She can't wait. Yes, he's at zero. He probably was partly through the veil. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no question what they're talking about. The veil of life and death. They are talking about the death of J.J. Vallow. August 10th. Again, Lori initiating this conversation. Do you think there is a perfectly orchestrated plan to take the children and we just have to wait for it to be carried out? I feel lost like I should be doing something to help. Not, I think we shouldn't kill the children. I should be doing something to help for the children to be taken. And Chad tells her, there's a plan. What should I be doing? What do I need to do to make this happen? That's what Lori's asking. And he tells her she's doing everything right. He said to just keep resolving the telestial issues so you are unencumbered and fully free. Unencumbered by your children, fully free. Think about the money. Think about how Lori would talk about JJ. She saw him as difficult. The same conversation. Chad expresses his love and Lori says, I cannot, I can't wait. Literally can't wait. I have no patience. I want you now. Again, she's using sex to reinforce. Chad's telling her what she wants to hear. There's a plan to get rid of these kids. She reinforces him. The next day, Lori says to Chad, I'm so alone without you, it's devastating. He says, we are surrounded by celestial relatives that are simply obstacles. I'm so sick of it. Again, she doesn't say, maybe we shouldn't kill our relatives. Me too. What is it that you really want? Never a hesitation. She wants to move forward with this plan. They move to Rexburg. Alex Cox sends Lori an, a text about setting up their Wi-Fi. The password, too many kids. Too many kids. And she says, funny. It would be funny if her children were alive and just rambunctious and hard to deal with. But that's not what it meant. Her children are dead. There were too many kids, and they had to get rid of them. And he says, I can change the password. And she says, we are trying to get to the bottom of what we need to do to eliminate them completely. He would mentioned Zs or zombies in the text above. And then again, I'm sure you will be told also, manipulation of Alex Cox with religion. I will provide you this information in the future.
four days before Tammy is shot at. Big news about Tammy. Please let me know if you're awake and can talk. I love you. Chad goes into this conversation about Tammy being in limbo. There's a demonic entity in, in her. He goes on and on. And then what does he say? Please seek a confirmation on this. Why is that important? Because Chad's not going to act without Lori saying so. Seek a confirmation. Not fully sure of the timing for removal, but once her actions verify the differences, I don't want to wait. And he's asking Lori for confirmation on that. Interestingly enough, two days after that conversation, Lori texts Melanie Boudreau, I'm really feeling like we need to go to Missouri and work. They go to Missouri. They fly out of Phoenix that, uh, the morning of the 9th, head to Missouri. So she's gone at the attempted shooting. So she can try to separate herself from the attempted shooting. Melanie asks her some questions about the kids and about the logistics. Lori says, tells her, you need to be unavailable. That's the schedule. And how does Melanie respond? Okay, Captain. Why does she say okay, Captain? Because Lori's in charge. The day of Tammy Daybell's death. She's texting Chad, not fun without you. His wife just died. She didn't just die, she was murdered. And that's why she feels comfortable texting him like this. The next day, she says to him, I'm missing you more. I need you desperately. I can't wait. That same day, he texts her about the Lily workout plan. Remember, Lily is another name for Lori. This is her workout plan for him to get in shape. She says, I love that plan. Not soon enough, though. This is torture. She's moving this along. She's moved this plan along the whole time. Again, just more love text between Chad and Lori. Ladies and gentlemen, you have your instructions. You're going to go back and you're going to deliberate. Read them carefully. Consider all the evidence. Look at all the facts. Look at the timeline. Look at the timeline. Charles Vallow, Tylee Ryan, JJ, Tammy. All within a short time frame. Who, how are they tied together? Who could have killed those people? You have Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, Alex Cox. Who had motive to kill those people? Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. What is the thread between Alex Cox and Chad Daybell? Lori Vallow. Who benefits from these murders? Lori Vallow gets Tylee's money. She gets JJ's money. She and Chad get Tammy's money. Ladies and gentlemen, the burden is beyond a reasonable doubt. A doubt based on reason and common sense. What does your reason and common sense tell you? You've seen what happened to her children. What happened to Tammy? She never reported the children missing. She lied and she lied and she lied about where they were. And while she lied, she kept collecting the money. You saw the text between her and Chad. She is moving this plan forward. That's part of what, that's why they moved her expert. She's moving this plan forward. There is no question that Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell were murdered. Who is the common thread? Lori Vallow. What does justice for these victims require? It requires a conviction of each and every count. She conspired for Tylee to die and to keep money. 
She conspired for J.J. to die and to keep his money. She aided and abetted in Tylee's murder. She encouraged it. She aided and abetted and encouraged J.J.'s murder. She aided and abetted and encouraged, or she conspired. Let me repeat that. She conspired and agreed to Tammy Daybell's murder. Look at the timeline. Ladies and gentlemen, go back through the elements. Go back through the evidence. And you must convict her. That concludes the state's closing argument. Uh, I'm going to suggest we take another recess at this point, if that's all right, Mr. Archibald, and then uh, we'll hear closing arguments from the defendant. All right, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. on about 20 minutes. Thank you. Let's have the jurors brought in, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. We're back on the record on case CR 22-211624. Concluded our morning recess. The jurors are all properly seated. The defense is present with counsel as well as the state. At this time, the state concluded its closing argument. The defense may now present its closing argument. Mr. Archibald. Mr. 
So, looks like I'm going to go into the lunch hour. Do any of you need to have any plans to be make phone calls or anything for lunch? I'm going to go into the, into the lunch. Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, you have a tough job. We talked about this uh, almost seven weeks ago when we first met. Uh, you came in and filled out your questionnaires, and, and we talked about uh, hardship and bias, and uh, we talked about that this would be a difficult case. So uh, you were asked if you could be fair and impartial, reserve judgment till the end, and we're getting close to the end. So uh, you were asked to be patient and attentive while putting your job, your family, uh, your life on hold. Uh, so again, thank you. And uh, thanks to opposing counsel. Um, you know, we're, we're small town lawyers. We're not from Boise. Uh, we see each other frequently. We have to get along because we have a lot of cases together. Our system is adversarial in nature. We're called opposing counsel. But we do respect each other, and we respect the positions and the jobs that we have to do. Uh, you've seen a lot of PowerPoints over the past uh, month, and uh, I'm sorry that I, I don't have one. So I'm just going to talk to you, if that's okay, and talk to you about uh, the evidence and the arguments and the law. and. Uh, my clients always ask me, why does the prosecutor start and end? Uh, so after I'm done, then the this, this state gets to have another go crack at him. And that's just because of their burden of proof, that the state has the burden of proof. So they get to go first and they get to go last. And so my clients always wonder, that's not fair. It's just our system. That's how it works. So who is Lori Vallow? Uh, what happened? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? That's what you've been asked to figure out. And that's what you need to be convinced of beyond a reasonable doubt. So you've heard a bit about her background from her sister, her son, her friends. Uh, she was born in 1973 in California. She turns 50 next month. Uh, raised there, dad, mom, brothers, sisters, uh, attended schools there. Uh, got married right out of high school, got divorced. Uh, went to beauty school, got married again in Texas. Her son Colby, who you met, born and raised in Texas and Arizona. Uh, she worked hard as a single mother, uh, got married and divorced again, and her third marriage was to Joe Ryan in Texas. Tylee was born. You've heard a lot about Tylee. Uh, she had some medical issues. Children needed protected from her third husband, so a divorce. Uh, court involvement, fourth marriage to Charles Vallow, lived in Texas and Arizona and Hawaii. You've heard about that. Charles had two kids. Lori had two kids. So they adopted a child to have one together, and that was JJ. Kid, five kids uh, between them. Uh, five kids forever. You heard what that was about. You heard that J.J. Uh, had medical issues when he was born and uh, and that Charles and Lori were a good fit for him and uh, they loved him and they cared for him. So then the story about Lori Ballow as you've heard, changes dramatically in October of 2018. Uh, who is Chad Daybell? Uh, this, she had read some of his end of the world books, 
She knew about some of his sayings. Uh, immediate, the first, the, the first time they met, uh, he told her they were married in previous lives. They had multiple lives, multiple probations. We are archangels. We have other names like Methuselah and Raphael and James and Elena. Uh, we've been selected to lead 144,000. Our mission on earth is to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Uh, evil spirits are real. When they possess a body, they need to be cast out. People have light and dark ratings. Uh, and then she and Chad were married in the temple, and Jesus was there. So quite a remarkable change from the people who knew Lori. Uh, what the heck is going on? Uh, how can how can this be? Uh, so fast forward a year from October of 2018 to November of 2019. One year after meeting Chad, uh, four people are dead. Uh, one of those deaths you don't consider as guilt for this case. That's it's really difficult for jurors to do. Wait a second, you told me that Charles was killed, but you don't want me to consider it for guilt. Uh, but for some other reason, what other reason is there? So the judge gave you an instruction about that, and and that's that's difficult. It's difficult for lawyers to figure out. And I so if you have questions about that, that that's a tricky instruction. Uh, so three others are dead in Idaho. Lori's arrested first, as you heard the jail calls, and then Chad. Uh, so you've now heard about a summary of the indictment, what she's charged with. I talked to you uh, weeks ago about pay attention to who does what. Uh, pay attention to a uh, burden of proof that I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to call a witness. My client doesn't have to testify. And you can't hold any of that against me. You can't hold it against her. Uh, because sometimes that just happens in a trial. And so it's not for you to guess who or why, uh, but to just consider the evidence that's been presented. So we, the judge has talked to you about what reasonable doubt means, what presumption of innocence means. Uh, and this is an important job that you have to do. And, uh, and so again, I, I want to thank you for that. Pretty soon, six of you are going to get bumped. And that is terrible. To have to sit through a trial, there's 18 of you, and the, and the judge is going to pick name, numbers out of a hat to see who stays and who goes. Because only 12 can deliberate at once. And so, uh, I think the plan was that during a long trial, someone's going to get sick, someone's going to have uh, issues at work or at home or a death in the family. Something's going to happen that it's going to, some of you aren't going to show up. And all of you showed up, every single one of you. And that typically the, when we have so many alternates, there's a reason for that is because over a long time, uh, things happen at home. So it's super bad to sit here for seven weeks and then have to go home and don't even get to deliberate. And so for you alternates who get bumped, again, we don't know who you are yet. Uh, I'm, thanks again for your service, but I'm, I'm sorry you don't get to de deliberate with your fellow jurors. So since the trial started, you've been able to see my client. You've been able to see her. 
responses to the evidence. We've been able to uh, see all the evil eye glares that she gets from the audience directed toward her every single day. You've been able to see the witnesses, you've been able to see the exhibits, and you've been able to listen to the tapes. Uh, six times during this trial, you heard my client's voice. Uh, Detective Stubbs, <laughs> Colby Ryan, Summer Shiflet, Chad Daybell, and a podcast with others. So if you want to remember how she responded, what she said, go to those six pieces of evidence. And you can listen to them again in the jury room. So uh, is this case about money, power, and sex? So that's the state's theme of the case. I respect their theme, and I'd like to, I'd like to talk about it. Uh, so is this case about money? Well, you have an exhibit, 68A, and this exhibit that was admitted is Tylee buying a car in April of 2019. Charles Vallow is the co-signer. Charles tells the bank that he's a full-time professional marketer that he makes $500,000 a year. Charles says this in Exhibit 68A. So in other years, he's, Charles has stated he makes $400,000 a year. That's in Exhibit 66D. Either way, the Social Security money that she'll make from a dead spouse will never equal 400,000 or 500,000 a year. Never. So that social security money, did Lori, with a spouse who makes 400,000 to 500,000 a year, really want to kill Charles for money? That, that just doesn't make sense. The math does not add up there. So, uh, so would she leave Charles and go to Chad for money? And what did we learn about Chad and money? According to Samantha Gwilliam, he's an author who has gone bankrupt because he can't sell enough stupid books about the end of the world so his wife, Tammy, who would rather stay home with their five kids, she has to work at a school for $15,000 a year. And then from an insurance agent, we learn that Chad almost qualifies for Medicaid, but not quite, so he had to find an insurance plan because he made twenty to 30000 a year. So Lori wanted to ditch Charles Vallow who makes four hundred to five hundred thousand a year, and go to Chad, who makes twenty to thirty thousand a year, and she wanted to do that for money. That my math, that just doesn't doesn't add up. So then the state says, well, maybe uh, she killed for power, and this is about power. So Lori wanted power. So how did that work out, Lori? In the year that Chad convinced her that she was a sexual goddess and a leader of the 144,000 and that she was going to save the world, how many converts did she have? Zero. I'm counting a big fat zero. How many converts did Chad have? Again, we have to get to 144,000. How many converts did Chad have? I count maybe six. Uh, Melanie Gibb, Zulema Pastinas, Audrey Baratario, and three from the same family. Lori Vallow, Alex Cox, and Melanie Bedro. Was Ian Pulowski a convert to the cause? Nope. David Warwick? Nope. 
April Raymond, no. Colby Ryan, no. Summer Shiflet, no. So this great and wonderful cause of saving the world, uh, getting ready for Jesus to come, we need to gather up the 144,000. And in one year, we got six. Chad got six. Lori got zero. So, again, doing some simple math. Chad and... Chad has 143,994 people left to gather before Jesus comes. So at the rate of six people a year, it'll take Chad uh, 24,000 years to get his army assembled. So the math is ridiculous. So is this case about sex? Uh, you want to have sex outside of marriage, you don't go for it. Happens every day in America, unfortunately. So use your reason and common sense when you look at pictures of Chad and you look at pictures of Charles. Uh, was that a physical attraction? Uh, to trade in Charles for Chad, was that a trade up? Or was that a trade down? Is she falling in love with Chad because of his money? No. She's reading his books during a vulnerable time in her life. And this guy is telling you you're a goddess. A sexual goddess, no less. And you're special and amazing and wonderful and by the way, we've already been married in previous lives, so it's not really cheating. And we, and also by the way, we were best friends with Jesus, and so if Jesus approves, then everything's okay. So that's quite a pickup line by Chad to Lori, and it worked. How did that work? Pretty, pretty scary that that pickup line from Chad to Lori would work. So what did the evidence tell you? What were you convinced of beyond a reasonable doubt? Her children are dead. No question about that. But did she kill anyone? And that's where the state concedes. Yeah, these, these people are dead. But did Lori do it? So you listened to 60 witnesses, you received hundreds of exhibits, and there's literally thousands of exhibits you can review that are on those flash drives. So I want to go over some of that with you. 60 witnesses included city police, county police, state police, federal police. Uh, they have a lot of resources available to them, as we found out. And you can find out a lot of stuff about someone. And, and what I've learned about doing trials over the years is that you will pick up on something that I didn't. And this juror will pick up something that that juror didn't. And why is that? Because we all have our own common sense and our own reason. And we all have our own life experiences on which to draw. So we see things differently, and that's okay. Uh, that's what makes this a great system. For you 12 jurors from 12 different backgrounds to get together and talk about this. So I'm just going to point out some of the witnesses, not all. You have your notes to rely on. If I state things differently than what you state, that what you wrote down, then as the judge said, rely on your memory, uh, not mine. So the first witness here in this trial was Kay Woodcock, Charles' sister. 
She described Charles and Lori as the all-American family. They were great parents. She trusted her brother, Charles. She trusted Lori. Uh, they were good parents. They each had two kids. Then they adopted one together, and it was just perfect. And she told you, as every other witness, something changed in late 2018 or early 2019. Uh, Brandon Boudreau, he testified, gosh, Charles and Lori were, were great. Uh, my kids played with their kids. I loved that family like my own. But then all of the end of the world talks ramped up and things got weird. Uh, so Charles died. I got divorced. I got shot at, uh, and so things just got really weird really quick. Uh, Officer Hermosillo, what a tough job he has uh, when he had to describe the, the stench, the smell of decaying bodies uh, during a search of Chad Daybell's property. That was, that was pretty brutal. Uh, and what did he tell you? He said, Chad Daybell, when the cops showed up, called his lawyer uh, to make sure that the cops could be there. And what's Chad doing? He's outside looking over his shoulder. And then he sped away and got arrested. Uh, so when Chad was looking over his shoulder, what's that inference? that Chad knew what was in his backyard. He knew that time was short for him. So then Detective, or uh, Captain Wilmore, captain at the jail, he, uh, he recorded a phone call Lori made from the jail to Chad when he was at his property. And uh, when I listen to this call, it's apparent to me that Lori, that Lori does not know what's in Chad's backyard. But I'm Lori's lawyer, so don't trust me. Uh, listen to it again. So that's the way I hear it. Lori does not know what's in Chad's backyard. She knows her kids are missing. She knows that kids aren't with her. She knows that they're safe and happy, whatever that means. If that means people are dead, if people are safe and happy, if they're in heaven. Um, but does she know that Chad and Alex stuffed her kids in Chad's backyard? So listen to it again, and you make your determination. So then we have other witnesses about, uh, uh, and I know weirdness isn't a legal term, but that's the only way I can describe this, all this just this religious babble, uh, all about uh, you've been mar married and. <laughs> Previous lives, multiple probations, uh, multiple lives, uh, special missions on earth, uh, light and dark scales, uh, contracts with Jesus or contracts with Satan. Um, just, uh, just a lot of stuff that really does not make sense. Uh, so you have to sort through that to see... Um, Again, in America, in America, you can believe how you want, but uh, you can't go killing people. And so, what are they talking about? What's up? What is all this religious talk? Then uh, Melanie Gibb records Lori. You'll have a chance to listen to that. That's where Lori says, with Chad sitting right there, the kids are safe and happy. And so... Uh, 
Does she know her kids are dead? Well, she knows they're not with her. Does she know that Chad and Alex were out in the backyard together? Remember all the GPS data? Lori's not there. Lori's not in the backyard when Chad and Alex are. She's not coming and going to Chad's property on those days that the state points out. She's not there. They're calling her. They're texting her. Are they texting about, hey, today's the day we're going to kill some people. Is that okay with you? We don't know that. Or are they saying, yeah, I'm just running an errand. I'll be back. Do you want uh, a real Coke or a Diet Coke? We don't know the content of those text messages. Unfortunately, we have lots of content of text messages about the James and Elena story. We have lots of that crap. But we don't have any text about today is the day we kill people. So look, look for that. Look for the lack of evidence about who's doing what. Part of your job. That's part of your job to figure it out. And if lack of evidence is, is something that the state hasn't shown, you can't hold that against me. You can't hold that against my client. You hold the lack of evidence against the state because they have the burden of proof. And I didn't make up those rules. The judge didn't make up those rules. We're all following the law. And that's what the law tells you to do. And so we have other witnesses. Uh, Chad's blessing on uh, Alex. Uh, you can listen to that if you, get, if you want to. Listen to that again. Uh, just to me, it's, it's craziness. Uh, Opening the portals of time, third creation, fourth creation, great warriors exalted in the fourth creation, could have gone on to exaltation but came back in the fifth creation. In the heck is Chad talking about? Uh, he's the leader of his new church, the Church of the Firstborn. He calls himself a patriarch. Uh, just... Just goofy stuff. You hear from other other witnesses about this uh, religious talk. Um, you hear from Colby Ryan, uh, my client's son. Uh, Lori was a great mom. She did everything to protect us kids. I would never think she'd do anything to harm anyone. She taught us to do good. To follow Jesus. After she met Chad Daybell, she changed. Her beliefs changed. That telephone call that you heard, and again, if you want to hear it again, please do. Uh, just so painful. Uh, so painful. For, for Colby. Um, you heard from April Raymond, her Lori's friend from Hawaii. Lori was nice and normal. Um, she was a friend, a neighbor. We went to church together. And then Lori came back a year or two later for a visit, and she had changed. She talks talked about demons. She talked about people being possessed. She talked about leaders of the 144,000. She asked me if I would join them and be separated from my children to join them. And I could leave my children with their father. And what was April Raymond's response? Um, no thanks. Um, I'll, I'll stay here in Hawaii, but 
but uh, good luck to you on your mission. You heard from uh, Sydney Shank, a BYUI student hired by Lori for babysitting JJ. Now, if Lori has a plan to kill her kid next week, why go to all the trouble to hire a babysitter? Why bring the babysitter over and introduce her to JJ and the medicines and the routine and the school? Why check JJ into school if you're going to kill your kid next week? Why do that? Because Lori didn't have a plan. The state wants you to think that this was Lori's plan to kill her kids. But exhibit, look at Exhibit 82A. It's Lori's rental application for a Rexburg apartment. It's dated August 14th, 2019. It's two weeks before she moves to Idaho. She wants to rent in Rexburg. So exhibit 82A is a rental application. She puts on there that she has two kids, Tylee and JJ. She puts on there that she's living on Social Security income. So if her plan was to kill the kids as she got to Idaho, in fact, the state saying Tylee went missing the same week they got to Idaho. Uh, why list her kids on the rental application? If you're moving from Arizona to Idaho, uh, why not go drop off the kids somewhere else? Why not? Why tell everyone you have two kids? Why enroll them in school? Why hire a babysitter? The only thing that makes sense to me is that she didn't have a plan. She wanted to be with Chad. They were obviously having an affair. Chad told her all the time about dark and light things. But there was no plan by Lori to kill her kids, or else she wouldn't have done that. Uh, so she... Did she lie about it? Yeah, she did. When people started showing up, hey, where are your kids? And notice that she lied. Well, they're in Arizona. Well, they're in with Grandma. Uh, they're at a movie. That's right. They're at a movie, uh, Frozen 2. Um, so all lies. So why was she doing that? To protect Chad, her lover, her eternal, in how many worlds, companion. Uh, how can someone have that much control over you? And we've, we've heard about that, that over, over the years, haven't we? that reason and common sense of people just go out the window sometimes when religious principles are involved. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to us, does it? Um, we heard evidence from the FBI um, that one thing the FBI pointed out is that Lori did not get life insurance for the children. Okay, so they're saying she's cunningly crafting a plan to knock off all these people. Wouldn't, how about go get an insurance policy on the kids? No proof of that, is there? So she didn't go get an insurance policy on her children. Well, does that tell you maybe she was not planning to kill her kids? Or else she would have gone. People do that all the time, right? I'm going to go get insurance on someone and then kill them, and then I'll get a bunch of money. And that is no insurance policies 
on the two children. Um, we heard from the FBI about who's out in the backyard. Uh, well, Chad and Alex are out in the backyard, not Lori. Um, and we heard from Summer Shiflet, uh, similar to Colby Ryan, just a real touching, touching witness. Um, known Lori her whole life. I'm Lori's younger sister. I'm close with Lori. She would have never done anything like this. Uh, that conversation is recorded. So if I've misstated anything, listen to it again. I have supported you your whole life. But Chad has lied to you. Chad has deceived you. She also talked about, told us about who Alex was. Alex was an adult man stuck in a 16 year old brain because of a car accident, a traumatic brain injury. That's who Alex was. Uh, Lori Summer told us was a good mother. She loved her children. She took care of them. She protected them from abuse. She never talked about zombies. She never talked about 144,000 or other weird stuff. Uh, she never talked about saving the world. Never talked about light and dark ratings. She taught her children good things. Tylee and Lori were cute together. Lori would never kill her kids, never agree for someone else to kill her kids. That's what Summer told you. So then we dove, dove into more evidence. Um, what was the cause of death? Uh, uh, the evidence that, that I'm sure you have notes on. I'm sure the photos are burned into your brain that you'd wish would go away, but we'll be, we'll, those photos will be with you for a while. They're hard to, hard to delete that stuff. Um, we, we talked about a hair in, on tape, on a piece of duct tape. So, uh, JJ's body had tape wrapped around it, and one of Lori's hairs was found on that duct tape. So, is that a smoking gun? No, not at all. And why not? Because that decomposition fluid was also in that bag. The pajamas were also in that bag. Kids' socks were also in that bag. A kid's blanket was in that bag. And so to say Lori's a killer because they found a piece of her hair on duct tape, that that's not true. I would hope all of you, your mothers, all of all of you who are mothers, I would hope that your hair is somewhere on your kids' pajamas, your kids' socks, your kids' blanket. It probably is. That doesn't mean that she's a killer. We talked a lot about uh, about Tammy's death, and uh, and Lori was in Missouri when she was shot at by either a paintball gun or a real gun. Uh, we don't know which because we didn't find any paintball residue and we didn't find any bolts. So the evidence is we just don't know. We spent a lot of time talking about what we don't know. Uh, and the evidence is clear that Lori was in Hawaii when Tammy died. And what did Tammy die of? Well, natural causes at first, then asphyxia second. And so what, what did the doctor tell you? Well, 
I talked to the police as part of my investigation as to what, what they think happened. That's, that's okay. That's what a doctor's supposed to do, get the history. So the doctor gets the history and says, well, maybe it was asphyxia instead of natural causes. And um, then the doctor said, well, yeah, I guess it could have also been seizures because she, because Tammy had been on Prozac for a long time. And seizures are a side effect of long-term use of Prozac. So that death is up in the air. Is she, was she even murdered? Is it a natural death? Um, Chad, to, to believe that it's, that she was murdered, uh, Chad is so smooth that he convinced a county coroner, a county assistant coroner, or deputy coroner, and a police, and a, another policeman, that it was all natural causes, and convinced his kids. Because remember, the kids showed up. Oh my, what happened to mom? And Chad convinced them all, sorry kids, uh, mom died in her sleep. Okay, dad. So, um, just, uh, just, just evidence. You're being asked to convict Lori on killing Tammy when Lori's in Hawaii. Uh, you're asked, you're being asked to convict Lori for killing Tammy when do we even know for sure it's a homicide? Has that been, have you been convinced beyond a reasonable doubt? that it's even a homicide. So, um, we hear from the neighbors, good folks, uh, Alice Gilbert and Todd Gilbert, uh, nice people who, who say, uh, yeah, Chad told us that his wife Tammy was going to die before she hit 50 years old. And so if if Chad had told that to the nice neighbors who hung out with Tammy, wouldn't Tammy had also known about her husband's prophecy? Wouldn't Tammy, wouldn't that explain why Tammy increased her life insurance? Not because she, not because Chad was manipulating her to get more life insurance, but because Tammy. What do we What do we know about that? That, that Tammy was still with Chad, even how nutty Chad was. She was still there. She still had five kids with him. She went bankrupt with him trying to sell his stupid books, and she's still there with him. She's still loyal to him. So her prophetic husband, who says, Dear wife, you're going to die next year, would that cause her to increase her life insurance so that her kids could be provided for? Prove to me that that's false. There's no proof that that's false. Then after the nice, uh, oh, and the Lori's statements are also introduced as evidence with the Gilberts as well. So if you want to listen to that, you can. Um, then we hear from Audrey Baratario. And uh, I got a little excited during that testimony, so if I offended any of you, I apologize. Uh, that testimony, uh, I thought the witness was making up stuff, and uh, so, so I got a little excited. But what did we learn from Audrey? Um, well, she's married to Jesus. That's kind of cool. Um, 
I'll follow you to five different states, but I'm really not a follower. Um, and uh, I don't like it when my good friend Lori tells me for no reason that she's going to kill me. Uh, and I'm not going to testify about that under oath uh, because I'm scared. So just, uh, again, more more weird stuff. Um, Chad had been Methuselah in the Old Testament. He had been James in the New Testament. I moved to Missouri because that's where Jesus is coming. And by the way, I'm married to Jesus. I moved to Missouri because uh, that's where Adam and Eve lived. Um, and uh, so you just have to sort through that and figure out what's credible and what's not credible with these witnesses. What is real and what is imaginary. We heard from witnesses about uh, texting and all the texting back and forth. Uh, Chad keeps telling Lori what's been revealed to him. Lori keeps asking Chad what's going to happen next. Because uh, he knows he's the equal to Jesus. He's act, Chad has actually been to heaven and come back. And so Chad knows everything. Uh, when Chad's naming of evil spirits doesn't work, oh, it's because another one's there. When uh, sometimes Chad, yep, someone's close to 0%. And then uh, another time, yep, this person's close to 99%. So even, even Chad's making it up as he goes. He can't remember if 0% is where people die or if 100% is where people die. I got, I got that mixed up. Here's a chart that works, says Chad. This is when my friend's wife died, my neighbor died, George Bush. Stan Lee. Uh, so Chad makes references to Stan Lee, Marvel comic, right? Also makes reference to Harry Potter. Uh, so what's what's going on in Chad's brain? Uh, well, you and I wouldn't believe it, would we? But some people do. Haven't we seen in history uh, that some people follow uh, re religious leaders when it doesn't make sense to us? Uh, so was it proven who killed Charles? Yes, it was Alex. But you can't consider that for guilt. That's kind of tricky, huh? You can't consider that for guilt on the other three, but for some other reason. Was it proven who killed Tylee? No, but Alex and Chad were at her grave site in Chad's backyard. Alex's fingerprints were on her, the tools. Chad had said, Tylee doesn't like me. He had told that to people. So I'm guessing Chad and Alex on Tylee. Did they prove that Lori directed it or conspired? Of the 15,000 texts that you have in evidence, show me one where it says, from Lori, so when are you killing Tylee? Was it proven who killed JJ? No, 
But Alex and Chad were at his gravesite in Chad's backyard. Chad got in a scratch fight. Remember that testimony? Chad got in a scratch fight with JJ the night before. Maybe that could explain this scratches on JJ's neck. So witnesses described this scratch fight. Um, so, and how about uh, JJ's burial site? That Alex was only out there, what was it, 17 minutes? Is that what the FBI guy said? That Alex was out there 17, 17 minutes on that day. So certainly not enough time to dig a meticulous grave and bury a child, find a board from the garage, find rocks that lined up perfectly. Certainly not enough time for Alex to do that on his own. So I'm guessing he had help from Chad. And of the 15,000 texts that you have in evidence, show me one where Lori's part of that conspiracy. When are you killing JJ, by the way? There is no such text. We have 15,000 of them, remember? So, why, why can't people escape religious cult figures? Why can't they break out? Why can't they break away from that mind control? The promises are marvelous to some people. They sound like stupid gibberish to the rest of us. Uh, there are examples, you all know of examples, of people uh, committing suicide because their religious leader told them to. And, and you just have to keep asking yourself, why can't people escape? Why can't Lori escape and get back to her good mom life? Lori is not a leader of Chad's new church, the Church of the Firstborn. Lori so wants to testify of Jesus. You heard her on her podcast. She wants to tell the world how much she loves Jesus. She wants to tell you that she personally met him on more than one occasion. But is, Ch is Lori a leader or is she a follower of Chad? She so wants to be a leader, but she's not leading anyone. She's following Chad. She thinks Chad is following Jesus, but he's not. He's unfortunately being led by the storm. Not the first guy to be led by the storm. Um, so, uh, Chad, you'll see in the text, Chad, what about this? What about that? What should I do? Move to Idaho? Lori has never lived in Idaho. She's never lived in a cold place. Uh, she's always lived in warm places like California, you heard, Arizona, Texas, Hawaii, but, Chad, you want me to move to one of the coldest places in Idaho to be near you? Okay, I'll do it. Lori sees Chad as if Chad is Jesus. Lori tells people she's seen Jesus, but yet she still follows Chad. Blessings are being handed out like flies with some of the testimony. Uh, what does that even mean? I bless you. No, I bless you. Well, if you're going to bless me, then I'm going to bless you. What, what does Brandon Bedreau even mean when he says that? That the religious aspects of this group is so intense that common sense has vanished. 
So, uh, groups who actually do follow Jesus, they do good things, right? Jesus never killed anyone. He blessed everyone. He, he taught people how to get along. Jesus taught how to be respectful, how to be helpful. If someone wants your coat, give them your coat and your cloak. If someone wants, if someone wants you to walk a mile, walk two miles with them. However you can help someone, do that. Treat people like you want to be treated. Judge people like you want to be judged. Since you're a sinner, be kind and forgiving to sinners. If someone has offended you, forgive them. That's the Jesus that we know. That's the Jesus that Lori knew. That's the Jesus that Lori taught her children about. That's the Jesus that Lori believed in until she met Chad Daybell. So on your verdict form, there's not a box to check for did Lori have an affair? And we spent a lot of time on that issue, remember? On the verdict form, there's not a box to check to see if a crime was committed in Arizona. How many weeks did we spend on that issue? It's very specific, your verdict form. Did she kill? Did she plan to kill and steal? Not kill or steal, but kill and steal. And the proof has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. If it's not, the law says you must find her not guilty. No one here thinks Lori actually killed anyone. That's why she's charged with conspiracy. Because they think someone else did the killing. So they want you to be convinced that she's part of this plan. That there's a specific plan to kill on certain days. So if you find her guilty, will that bring the kids back? Nope. If you find her not guilty, will that bring the kids back? No. So you can't be concerned about that. What you are concerned about is following the law and following the evidence. Follow the law and the lack of evidence. This case is not about multiple lives or multiple creations. It's not about zombies, not about being a leader of the 144,000. If there's anything we learned about a storm, it's that you hide from a storm. You seek shelter from a storm. That's what you teach your kids, and that's what you know. Her sister and her son, those two who testified about her in this courtroom, have known her the longest. They would never imagine she would be guilty as charged. She spent her whole life protecting her children. Thank you again. That'll conclude the closing argument of the defense. At this point, the state will, well, let me just inquire, is the state going to offer a rebuttal? We will, Your Honor. Okay. With the state offering a rebuttal, the court is going to uh, take the lunch break at this point for the benefit of the jurors, and we will 
plan on coming back on, uh, let's say, in about 45 minutes, if we can, for the rebuttal argument. All right, Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Mr. Bailiff, we could have the jurors brought in, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho v. Lori Noreen Vallow. The defense just concluded their closing argument, and then we had the lunch recess. The court will note parties are all present, including the defendant. The jurors are also present and all properly seated. With that, uh, Mr. Wood, the state, I believe, will now offer its rebuttal. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And if I can have the my computer run through the, the monitor. Okay, you can set that up. Ladies and gentlemen, the state has met its burden beyond a reasonable doubt. Reason and common sense. Reason and common sense. The evidence in this case is clear. The evidence in this case points to one common thread, and that thread is Lori Vallow. The defense says she's not a killer. She is a killer. Lori is the connection to the deaths. What connection 
Chad Daybell have to Charles Vallow? Lori, why did we talk about Charles Vallow? For the motive. The defense says the math doesn't add up. Well, the defense didn't give you all the numbers, and you know that. The defense gave you a choice of four to five hundred thousand dollars a year versus Social Security. That's not all the numbers. Lori believed, and you've seen it through her text, she believed she was getting one million dollars. Not Social Security funds. She thought she was getting a million dollars. The math adds up. And what you see in this case consistently, when Lori wants something, she finds a way to make it happen, and she will get rid of any obstacle. She wanted the million dollars from Charles. She learned her lesson. She learned her lesson when she didn't end up getting the money that she found out afterwards. So when she needed more money, she went after Tylee's money. But remember, she learned her lesson. She waited until after the money hit her bank, and then they killed Tylee. You heard evidence multiple times. She called Tylee dark. With JJ, she'd learned her lesson. She waited until after the money hit her bank, and then they killed JJ. The defense says she's a good mom. Does a good mom, when the whole world is out looking for your kids, dance and laugh on a beach in Hawaii? No. Does a good mom abandon her children in the ground and go marry a recent, a recent widower? No. The defense spoke about the, her call with her sister, Summer Shiflet. Go listen to it. Please listen to it. And when Summer says, you were dancing on a beach in Hawaii, after, she's talking about the kids dying, and says, and you were dancing on a beach in Hawaii, what does Lori say? Yeah, months later. Months later. It's an admission. She knew her children were dead because she helped plan it. She knew her children were, were dead because she encouraged it. The defense app talked to you about life insurance versus Social Security. Doesn't really make sense. You have to show the dead body to get the life insurance. They couldn't do that. They kept the Social Security. Ongoing payments, monthly payments. The defense brought up, why would she put her son in school and get a nanny? You've heard from her own mouth or her own texts. She was tired of the obstacles. She was tired of JJ. She didn't want to deal with him, so she found someone else who could until they buried him in the ground. Let's talk a little bit about the lies Lori told, and then we'll go over the evidence just a little bit one more time. The lies Lori told tell us what really happened. Let's see what she lied about. She lied about Tylee being at BYU, BYU-Idaho. She lied to the police about she was going to go back to Arizona and take JJ to a special school. She lied to the school, Kennedy School, in Rexburg that JJ was with his grandparents. She lied about to the police about her brother trying to kill her. She lied when she sent a, an email to Chad disguised as K.K. Walker. She lied to Colby Ryan. JJ and Tylee's brother about where they were. She lied to Colby Ryan about how Charles Vallow died. Remember what he testified to. He had a heart attack. She told him he had a heart attack.
She lied to Melanie Gibb. She told Melanie Gibb that J.J. was with Kay Woodcock. She told Zulema that Melanie, that J.J. was with Kay Woodcock. She lied to the nanny. She said that J.J. had gone with his grandparents. She lied to the police about knowing, about how well she knew Chad. Called him her brother's friend, not her husband. They were married at that point. She lied to the police about J.J. being with Melanie. Remember the last thing that Summer testified to you, her own sister, when she was asked if Lori had been honest with her about the kids. And her response was that Lori had lied. Lori lied to cover her crimes, repeatedly. Again, does a good mom jet off to Hawaii when the rest of the world is looking for her kids? She knew where her children were. In fact, again, go back and listen to that, the tape with Summer. Go back and listen to the tape with Melanie Gibb. And she says, I know exactly where JJ is. That might be the one thing you've heard her say that's true. Because she did know where JJ was. Lori's lies tell us she's guilty. The innocent don't need to lie. The guilty lie. Think about all the evidence you've seen and her reaction. The body cam, when the police went and spoke with her. Go back and watch it. Count the lies. Watch her getting served poolside with the order to produce her children. And watch how she reacts. Listen, the defense asked you to listen to the jail phone call on June 9th. When Chad calls her and says they're searching the property. She's scared. You will hear it in her voice. You will hear the guilt and the fear in her voice because she and Chad both know what the police are about to find. Think about some of the physical evidence here. Bruises on JJ and Tammy. Think about the iCloud. Her words. Her words. The defense says there's no text where she says, I'm going to kill the kids today. Well, no, she doesn't say it like that. But she says it. Let's talk about some more of the physical evidence. The defense mentioned Lori's hair. It wasn't on his socks. It wasn't in his pajamas. That hair was on the duct tape wrapped around the black bag. On the same black bag that Alex Cox's fingerprint and palm print were on. It wasn't on JJ. It was in the duct tape that secured that bag. Think about all the electronic data you've watched or you've seen. Alex's movements, the flurry of information going before in, in form of text and phone calls on those critical dates. Lori knew exactly what was going on. Again, $1 million, not 500000 versus Social Security. The math adds up. And just quickly, because the defense brought up the text again, we bolded here where Lori is bringing up the kids. When they're talking about death percentages, from Lori, okay, find out her percentage, meaning Hillary, who is Tylee, find out, find that out for me, and JJ's. They mentioned the storm text, but they didn't tell you all the text. What does Chad say? Just grab me by the storm, and I will follow you to the ends of the universe. Not you will follow me, Lori. 
I will follow you. Don't let Lori pin this all on one other person. She was 100% involved in this, and all the evidence points to that. When she's talking to Melanie Boudreau, you, telling her, you can't go at all, this is the two days before Charles Vallow is shot. And she says to Melanie Boudreau, you can't leave. We both need to stay here to defend ourselves. It's coming to a head. This week will change everything. And then they killed Charles. Again, when Chad Daybell is texting her about JJ going into the light, we all know what that means. He doesn't have to say die. We all know what going into the light means. And again, what does she say? She doesn't say, let's not kill kids. She says, that is sweet. Again, here's Lori. I need you to check JJ. Check Tylee. She is encouraging. She is aiding. She's part of the plan. Again, Lori's own words. Hold her words against her. See if she got switched. Need you to check JJ. Think about all the times she says she has no more patience. And again, this text, one more time. From Chad, I got the inspiration to go back to my original death percentages that helped us track Charles. And we know what happened to Charles. He's dead. Not fantasy dead, not weird religion dead. He is dead, two bullets in the chest. Tammy is close. And how does she respond? What about JJ? This is clear. They're talking about dead people and tying Tammy to it, tying JJ to it. And when he says they're at 2 or 3%, she's upset that it's not zero yet. Again, please check JJ. Is he at zero yet? The defense says there's no text about killing the kids. Do you think there is a perfectly orchestrated plan to take the children and I should be doing something to help? Remember the text about Nathan Pachenko, who you heard was a singer. And she asks Chad what he thinks. He gives her a dark rating. He gives him a dark rating. Lori gives him a light rating. What does Chad do? Okay, we'll go with you. He will follow her till the end of the universe. Let's talk briefly, just briefly, one more time about what you need to find. The question you need to ask. Lori agree with Chad and Alex to commit the crime of first-degree murder against Tylee. Yes, she did. There's no question. And did she com and grand theft? Yes, the math is there. Did she intend for these children to die? Yes. What mother, if she didn't intend for her children to die, doesn't go report that she's missing or dead? It makes no sense to say that she's a good mom when she's not reporting the death of her children or that her children are missing. She intended the death. We've gone through the overt acts. We've met them in spades. You have the evidence. You must convict her. In regards to the murder of Tylee Ryan, you have to ask, did Lori Ballow engage in conduct, or did aid, abet, advise, or counsel another to engage in conduct which caused the death of Tylee Ryan? Yes. It is clear. The same applies to JJ. The same applies to Tammy. As the defense spoke, it reminded me of some of Zulema Pastana's testimony. 
when Lori would tell her friends that nothing she did in this life counted for her. She could do whatever she wanted. Nothing in this life counted for her. And she made a little motion she did. She'd go, doesn't count for me. Make it count for her. Make it count for Lori Vallow that Tylee Ryan was burnt, mutilated, buried in a bucket next to a dog and cat. That Tylee Ryan will never get to go to college, will never get to fully grow up. Make it count for Lori Vallow that JJ, a boy with special needs, had a plastic bag placed over his head and had to fight for his life. Make that count for her. And make it count for Lori that Tammy Daybell had to die so that Lori could get to that money, so that Lori could get to Chad Daybell. And make it count for her that she stole. Again, reason and common sense. Reason and common sense. Lori's behavior shows you that she is a killer. Lori's behavior is not the behavior of a mom concerned for the safety and welfare of her children. Justice for these victims requires a conviction. The state has met its burden. Ladies and gentlemen, reason and common sense. Reason and common sense. You must convict her. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that now concludes the closing <coughs> arguments. The evidence has been concluded in this case as well, so very soon you will retire for your deliberations. Uh, before so, I do want to address the jurors here. At the beginning of this case, 18 of you were seated to comprise the jury that would hear this case. At that time, you were all advised that upon the conclusion of the evidence and closing arguments, only 12 of you would proceed to deliberate and reach a verdict, and that time has come. Before I instruct the clerk to draw at random six numbers corresponding to your seat numbers to determine which six of you will become our alternates, I wish to thank you for your willingness to give of your time away from your accustomed daily pursuits and faithfully discharge your duty as jurors. I have a few instructions for you also. Uh, number one, if your number is selected as an alternate, you will, you will be dismissed but you should remain reachable and in contact with the bailiffs should you need to be recalled in your duty as an alternate. Second, you will receive some additional information to assist you as you leave today through the court administration office. Third, and importantly, while remaining an alternate, you're still under the obligation to continue to adhere to the admonishment you've been given each day by me as jurors when we break for the day. In the event you need to be recalled to rejoin your fellow jurors to deliberate, you won't be able to do so if you've discussed this case with other people, researched it in any way, or been exposed to any reporting or media that would compromise your impartiality. For that reason, please continue to abide by that instruction until you've been notified that either a verdict was reached in this case or you are recalled to assist your fellow jurors in additional deliberations. So 18 of you were called to serve as jurors in this case, while only 12 of you will deliberate and reach a verdict. All 18 of you have been a necessary part of this case to ensure the administration of justice. And for that, you have the sincere thanks of this court. At this time, then, I am going to ask our clerk to please draw at random six numbers as assigned to the juror seat numbers. And so we're clear with the seating chart uh, it's juror number one on the front row to my right going to juror eight. Juror nine, far right on the back row to juror number 18. 
So I will ask the clerks at this time to please uh, one by one draw out a total of six numbers and we'll indicate one at a time then who the alternates will be. Madam Clerk, you can proceed with that. So based on the random draw then, jurors 18, 1, 2, 17, 3, and 7 will be the alternate jurors. As I mentioned, in the event a juror remaining becomes ill or is excused for some reason, the alternate will need to return and the deliberations would start over. Again, you are excused with the sincere thanks of this court. Uh, please leave us your contact information and continue to abide by those admonitions. And with that in mind, would all please rise for the jurors. <laughs> All right, please be seated. Just a couple of quick orders of business then before the bailiffs are sworn and the deliberations begin. Um, first, the court has issued a redacted copy of the amended indictment, which will be provided with the jury instructions. Has the state received a copy of that amended indictment? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, and the redacted version, I should say. Thank you, Runner. Uh, just in reviewing this, the only thing I'm seeing is we still have the deputy presiding grand juror's signature. I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be redacted as well. All right. We considered that, and I think for purposes of submitting it to this jury, it's appropriate to leave that on there, and it won't be redacted. That was the only concern that the state had or the question. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Did the defense receive a copy of that redacted amended indictment? Yes, we received a copy. All right. Did you have any comment or objection to that being submitted with the jury? I had objected to the indictment being amended uh, in the first place, so yes, I'll rest on that objection. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Uh, with that, then, the redacted version will be submitted to the jurors along with the original set of jury instructions and an original verdict form. So I'll instruct the bailiff to please have the 12 remaining jurors return to the courtroom. We'll there uh, swear the bailiffs in after that, and then deliberations can begin.
Attorney's Office, Tanner Courtyard. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, at this time I will have the clerk swear in the bailiffs for their jury service, and we will swear in two bailiffs for this, please. Do we want to swear three or two? I was told three. Two? Okay, we'll swear two bailiffs then. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will keep this jury together in some quiet and convenient place, and you will not suffer any communication to be made to them, nor make any communication, I'm sorry, nor suffer any communication to be made to them, or make any communication to them yourself on any subject connected with the trial of this case, except to ask if they have agreed upon a verdict, and upon their agreeing upon a verdict, you will return them in open court, or upon the order of the court, so help you God. I will. All right, thank you, bailiffs. At this point then, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the case is now in your hands. I will advise you that you'll be receiving a original copy of the jury instructions. You each have your copies as well to refer to. There will be one verdict form in a separate folder. I'll just also note that there are a lot of instructions in there. I would direct you to first consider instruction 38, which directs you to select a presiding officer once you retire to the jury room as a starting point. So with that in mind, the bailiff will now escort you to the jury room, and you may begin your deliberations. All rise, please. Please be seated. All right, counsel, please provide your contact information for each side in case there is any message from the bailiffs, including a potential question from jurors if that arises. Please keep in close proximity to the courthouse, and the court will advise you of any developments during these deliberations. With that, we will be adjourned until we hear back from the jury. Thank you.